Hello, good morning and uh, welcome to the first episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast for 2022. So uh, this was Happy New Year, everyone. Happy and New you, Year. Man. Yeah, happy New Year to you and all. Yeah, thank you very much. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, mate. Yeah, good. I've, I've infused to be back. Yes. I really am. I mean, I enjoyed the yeah. break. Don't get me wrong. I, I think the break it. was good, but I think for me more so, it was probably a little too good because I, I had struggled getting into this and getting back into the routine of like, you know, researching, watching various things and yeah, making yeah. notes of stuff. I think I had too much of a break. <laughs> yeah, think, that's fair enough. As, uh, as it may, as it sort of turned out. But yeah, luckily I brought it back and got back on track. Yeah, but, man. Uh, yeah, no, it was a good, good break. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, yeah, jumping back in and... Uh, yeah, getting going, and we certainly uh, start off with a with a doozy, we don't do. we? Yeah. But um, for those that don't know, um, my, my name's Callum, and I'm one of your co-hosts. And as you've already heard, thankfully, is uh, is Scott back with me again? Indeed, indeed, I am. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, as uh, hopefully keen listeners will know, this is. Uh, the official start of season two season of the two, uh, baby. podcast, which was a, a fairly recent um, decision mm. towards the end of uh, last year with, with where we'd been going with the various episodes and the, the subject matter. We were starting to sort of point in a, in a sort of in a direction um, that was similar enough that we could have just continued, but it's also, it takes us down a different path. So we yeah. thought have a, you know, fresh start kind of sign off season one and, you know, in, in 2021 and, uh, mm. yeah, start afresh uh, this year with, yeah. I'd, with I'd, season I'd two. I had no so. idea that we'd see out season one, let alone start season two, to be I, honest. I didn't think we'd get to episode one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was a point where it wasn't yeah. going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, never mind get to this point. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we're still, obviously, we're still very much enjoying it. And, yeah, thank you again to all you, you know, listeners for, um, you know, sticking with us because as much as we do it for our own enjoyment, you guys do help make it that little bit kind of more worthwhile. Um, and some of the reactions we've had to some of the episodes has just been insane. Like the the numbers that have just shot up over, you know, a matter of days. You know, we as we've said before, we've we set a fairly modest target of, you know, I think fifty plays for each episode. Per episode. Yeah. Just just as something to kind of aim for. Um, you know, I know there are people like Mr. Rogan, who get millions, but you know, yeah. for us fifty is enough for now. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, and some of our episodes hit that within days of of it dropping yeah um, so thank you very much so, for yeah, listening thank you we really uh, do appreciate it thank you very much and uh, and whilst we're on the um the thank yous um to do our obligatory shout outs um firstly to our beloved patrons james and justin thank you very much thank you very much uh, you continue to support? as always yep the, the continued support and and the uh the interactions as well mm. the, the the points the opinions the questions that they that they pose you know certainly gets us talking and you know keeps us on uh, on our toes so yeah. um yeah it's it's of course not just the uh you know the monetary support or or contributions no, no, but it's far more about the the other stuff and and just that you know there are people out there listening that are as you know just as into it as uh as we are <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know right yeah. <laughs> so we're not alone <laughs> um but you know as always remember um to all the other listeners out there that you too can be a part of this uh, prestigious uh, supporters club <laughs> prestigious <laughs> indeed yeah and uh, and you can uh, do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash cryptid ramblers podcast certainly very exclusive um, i don't know about prestigious it's exclusive for sure <laughs> <laughs> and prestigious i'll go with it but yeah make of that what you will yeah <laughs> um we've got uh at the moment, we've got two, you know, reasonably priced tiers to choose from, um, priced at uh, four and six pounds respectively, plus VAT. Plus VAT. Uh, we need to get that Very in there. Um, you'll get early access to each bi-weekly episode and a personal shout out, as uh, as you've already heard. Um, but if you're part of the higher tier, um, then you'll also see the video recording of um, each podcast. So. Uh, you'll get to hear our dulcet tones and also see our beautiful faces. Oh, so uh, right. if that's not... <laughs> you come back very... You, did you get like a dictionary over Christmas or yeah, something? Yeah, swallowed a dictionary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> word of the day or something. Yeah, word of the yeah. day calendar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got word of the day toilet paper and I swallowed it. Something's happened to you over the break. So, well, <laughs> you, you've extended your vocabulary. <laughs> well, coincidentally, I've got back into my writing. <laughs> so so oh, yeah, go, the aspiring author in me has uh, oh, reared its oh, ugly gotcha. head. So, you yeah, found those synonyms on... Uh, 
word, haven't you? That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll just right click and hit thesaurus, and then uh, I find most of my writing material. Are you call it a thesaurus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So if that's not, if we haven't sold it already, then uh, I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, any any support is uh, is is very much welcome. Um, now, of course, we can't do shout outs without uh, you know mentioning the uh, the home of. The Cryptid Ramblers podcast, where we where we are sitting right this minute, uh, the place where the magic happens. Our new purpose built studio here at Hellfire Studios. It is based in Southend in Essex, which is roughly forty five minutes from London, and it is the first podcast, film, and photography studio here in Essex. Hellfire Studio offers full content creation, so visit hellfirecreative.com for more info on all of that. Um, now, as always, for just being a listener of, of our podcast, you too can benefit from our sponsorship by receiving a 20% discount. Simply go to healthwisestudio.uk and use the code CRYPTID at the checkout um, and you'll benefit from a uh, bit of money off. off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, we've got... Um, That's your VAT and your tax and all that right there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah more or less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> yeah. um, now... A, a, a sort of additional update from yeah, I suppose the last couple that we've uh, that we've given. We are um, still ever closer to launching our new merch store. Yes, um, we've now got the designs. Uh, what well, the first few designs anyway over to uh, the guys over at uh, SOS. So um, hopefully they are they're getting mocked up onto you know the various items that will be uh, that will be uh, yeah, quite, making available. Quite excited about that. And, to be uh, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to seeing how they uh, how they all look on actual hoodies and t shirts and everything else. So yeah, um, yeah we'll sh- we'll share more on that as and when it becomes available to us. But uh, yeah, it's something to look forward to as we're going to be working with another local company, and we've both seen and tested the quality of the not only the print but the the clothing. And um, yeah, mm. we can certainly vouch for it. And I'll I'll definitely be making a. I purchased myself oh, yeah, of, uh, yeah. of one of them, um, as is my want. <laughs> so, uh, prerogative. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we'll be working on some uh, additional designs, um, which I guess will count as season one merch. Um, yeah, I guess so, Which yeah. we'll add in addition to the ones that we've already sent over to the guys. So, we'll, we'll have a, a good sort of spread of designs and styles for, for everyone. So, hopefully, it will hit your fancy. Um Right, That's all yeah. done. So, yeah, so right, let's yeah, get so on. We'll get into the episode. So yeah. this was um, this was quite an interesting one for for us to get back into. It was really. It and, was. Uh, we decided that we was going to really look into like cave systems and and such and, yes. and high strangeness surrounding them. And absolutely, yeah. Um, but we 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 came across a bit of a bit of a, a bump in the road, really, because what <laughs> we was finding. It's putting it politely, yeah. Yeah, I well, hit a brick wall. You hit a brick yeah, wall. <laughs> literally, a brick. I couldn't. I couldn't sort of see past where I was. Um, yeah. it, I, I kind of liken it to writer's block. You sort of you know where you are. Yeah, you know where you need to get to, but you just can't. You just can't get there. Well, the you- thing is, the reason why we decided to go into cave systems was because over the last year, various different caves and things like that, especially since like Helia, since we did our, Very much our so. Helia deep yeah. dive, the idea of um, high strangeness happening within caves or around caves. Yeah became quite a strong um, subject that we've been planning to look into. Yeah, got so we quite thought, invested in it. Yeah, so we thought, right, okay, let's let's start going down that route. But all we kept coming across was just very dry, academic f- uh, figure-telling, like copying yeah. from a textbook sort of schooling. Pretty much just writing down what was on Wikipedia. Yeah. You know, this is the name of the cave, this is where it is, this is how big it is. This is when they found Some it. Some people have said this. This many f- people died in it. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and it, was, it was it was a struggle to, you know, kind of, you know, get through it. And, yeah, my, my research had sort of hit a bit of a brick wall and I was really sort of struggling. And like I say, it was coming out of that break mm. and getting back into something... You know, for me, in hindsight, it may have it may have been worth you know starting with, you know, something, um, you know, easier along the same lines as what we were doing in you know like last year. Mm. But um, you know, as we discussed through the various episodes, we were you know finding this as more and more of a constant you know theme, and so it felt only right to um, you know to kick off you know with it, which is again why we decided to you know break the the show up into um, seasons. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as you say, it's um, 
I, I mean, mine hit a brick wall anyway, so I couldn't. And we had, you know, a number of you know conversations as we yeah, normally we do did, about yeah, where about it's taken us and, and yeah, kind of what we're finding and and yeah, and I was just finding the very kind of academic stuff, which you know, which I know from previous episodes is kind of you know is what I sort of tend to take on. Yeah. It's more of the sort of the academic kind of real world fact evidence driven. and fact driven kind yeah. of stuff. But on this subject in particular, it was just very dry and very. Very academic, well, more so than, you know, usual. And well, I was just is, like, this, this is, isn't throwing up anything that I was kind of hoping for. This is the strange thing about caves is that actually the subject of caves is incredibly interesting, especially when yeah. you, like, you take into account cave paintings and drawings, how yeah. far back they've gone, what they actually depict in those drawings. Yeah. Um, or paintings even. That, like, for instance, there was, um, I believe it was the, the the cave system that they found in Italy mm. that um, old Pablo Picasso went inside, had a look yeah. at it and just went, yeah, we've learned nothing new with regards to art. Yeah. This, with, if anything, this surpasses us. Yeah. Like it's about the yeah. perspective that, that was from these paintings, the, the brush yeah. strokes that was used and everything, yeah. the colours. Uh, it was, when you take that into account, that is all really, really interesting, but it's, it's difficult for us to put that into a, an audible medium for you guys. So Yeah, it's one thing reading it and, you know, looking at the articles, you know, watching the, you know, the various videos or, or you know, documentaries on it, but it, it's, it's then trying to translate that into audio yeah, content so- that is interesting. And if I was struggling, you know, as, as one of the hosts, to, <laughs> yeah. you know, to kind of get into it and, and find the right, you know, thread to pull, then I know it was going to be a struggle for, you know, the listeners to get into yeah. it. And there's no way we wanted to start off, you know, season two with a bit of a drab, you nah. know, hard going, you know, sort of episode. But luckily your research took you down a slightly different route, didn't it? Took me down a rabbit hole, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Almost, you know, a very big rabbit hole. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's really, really quite interesting. I mean, I've, I've been looking at this particular sort of stuff for quite a number of years. So if, I, I, if I hadn't been, I don't think I would have found this natural progression into this particular subject. Yeah. Um, you kind and of knew the thread was already there. You just had to see where, had where to, the research to took you to it. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. And I, I sort of knew the sort of places that we needed to go into. And basically, guys, what we're going to go into, we're going to go into in the inner earth theory. Yeah. Which so, is something, else, as you say, we both have been aware of, you know, more so from, you know, like sort of watching, you know, the Heliod documentaries and, mm. and in, you know, and other, other such, you know, sort of cryptids. But for me personally, I thought this was going to be a subject that we were going to be jumping into a little bit further down the line. Yeah. Like get you know, maybe half a dozen episodes under our belts kind of steering towards that sort of subject and then having like a maybe one or, you know, two or two parters set mm. up for it. But, um, but yeah, sometimes you can't ignore, you know, the research and well, it, it naturally I mean, took us is, in. This is what I said to you, wasn't it? Right. This is where the research has, has taken me with it and I'm, I'm following it. Um, yeah. And sometimes you just have to, don't you? You have yeah. to you find the rabbit hole when you know it is one, but you have to sometimes just fall down it and, and see where you end up. Go tumbling down the rabbit hole yeah. like Alice. So. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. So for anyone that has never heard of the inner earth theory, um, many ancient cultures spoke about a world within the earth and even spoke about its inhabitants, mm. um, usually beings that are much, much taller than us, which is a subject Pretty that much we've giants, previously covered. Yeah, which we've already done, yeah. <laughs> <You know>? There's <laughs> yeah. even the idea that the um, uh, the Patagonian giants were troglodytes, so they lived within caves yeah. as well. So this was, uh, again, and the redhead, going, um, why we was going giants. down this particular route. Yeah, the redhead giants. Were found, their, some of their remains were found in caves. Lovelock Cave in yeah, Nevada. That's it, Lovelock Cave, yeah, that's the one. So uh, the first, first of all, there is a, a popular idea that many, if not all, cave systems are in some way connected in a honeycomb-like structure underneath the surface. Yeah. Now, there is there is some evidence to suggest that that could actually be the truth of it, and, and we'll discuss yeah, a bit about a lot of that, that yes, this, yeah. this, this episode. Like, for instance, there's a cave system in uh, Texas where yeah. they found, um, basically, they're blind catfish, and they only right. live in caves, yeah. but they only live in one cave system, and that's in Central America the southern part of Central America, Mexico. Yeah. So there's a potential that those two cave systems are connected, are connected through waterways or, or just underground streams yeah. and yeah, waterways as you say, yeah. Yeah, so that idea is is it's not even a new one either. No. Um many occult 
um, organizations and esoteric authors um, and even like secret societies agree with the myths and legends of subterranean inhabitants and and their kingdoms as yeah. well um, and it's they believe that they are remnants of an antediluvian civilization yeah so when i say antediluvian i mean like pre-flood mm. so it kind of sounds a bit biblical <laughs> it does to an extent yeah. but we know that there was a global flood around about eleven to 12,000 years ago. I think it was um, 11,600 years ago was yeah. the end of a, um, a time period just called the Younger Dryas time period, which we've yeah. discussed before. We have. Yeah, we came um, up, yeah. And we know that the sea levels rose 400 metres. Yeah. So any civilization that existed would have been on the coast of, of all these land masses and instantly would have been swallowed by the sea. Yeah, um, I say instantly. It, it was something that happened over a, a hundred year period. Yeah. But so the Noah's Ark story relatively quick. essentially happened. Oh yeah, but absolutely. It was far, yeah, but it yeah. wasn't as quick as depicted. No, it wasn't like it was book. like in a day and a night. Suddenly, yeah. well, that's what they say Suddenly about Atlantis like as well. Yeah. Where Pl Plato said about Atlantis that in a day, in a single day and night, Atlantis was swallowed by the sea. Yeah, um, it's probably more likely that Atlantis, if it existed, yeah was swallowed by the sea over a, a very quick amount of time. In like, yeah. um, a ge like geographically, of a, yeah. a, it, it would have been like 100 years or something yeah. like that. But that's pretty quick, Yeah, really, <laughs> yeah. Um, in the grand scheme of things. <clears throat> yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, the idea is that they, they sought refuge in hollow caverns within the Earth's surface. Um, now, this is something, don't get this, the inner Earth theory confused with hollow Earth theory. Now, a hollow Earth is where it's like, like a hollow Easter egg. Mm. So there's like a land mass on the inside of the Earth's crust with a sun That's in the middle. That's what I was going to say, yeah. It's not to be confused with the hollow Earth yeah. theory. That yeah. one's a bit too out there. Yeah, yeah. The inner Earth one I can jump on board with. Yeah. Um, getting off the fence early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. Uh, right, that's it. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just want like people to understand that it's not hollow earth theory yeah. it's inner earth yeah. where there's like a hollow caverns in a honeycomb like structure across the earth's surface yeah and um, so, i mean some have been found yeah so it, it is oh, true so to an extent caverns, yeah. yeah absolutely huge caverns and yeah. obviously huge cave systems as well yeah, so absolutely yeah and like we have mentioned it before the mammoth cave systems and yes, in have, particular yeah. that came up with our helia saga it did definitely, um, yeah now, the idea that something strange was happening came up because of all the stories with regards to the Kentucky Goblins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I want to start a little bit with the, the Mammoth Cave system Yeah. and go into that. And again, guys, I'm not going to be too academic with it, but I'm going to give you some, <laughs> some figures. So the Mammoth Cave system is located in central Kentucky and covering well over 52,000 acres. So the Mammoth Cave was established as a national park in 1941 and a World Heritage Site in 1981. Now, it's got 400 miles of surveyed passageways, and they believe that there's more um, under there. So this by far makes this the longest known cave system in the world. Mm. Uh, so over twice of the second longest cave system in Mexico's Sac Ocatan underwater cave, which I believe that's the one where they had the blind catfish. Yeah. Um, archaeologists are constantly making new discoveries and additional connections within this cave system, adding several miles to the figure every single year. So they're still yeah, finding still more finding stuff, stuff in yeah. that cave system. And yeah. as we've suspected, it off, like when we've been looking at the various different maps and such, that it seems like the Mammoth Cave System runs along the Appalachian Mountains as yes. well. Yes, yeah. So, so there's no doubt there's going to be stuff in the Appalachians that are going to be entry points yeah and we've spoken about just cave. how old the Appalachian Mountains are as well yeah exactly yeah they're, they're so much younger than the Rockies which is a much more vast mountain range but yeah the Appalachians are old old yeah like there's there's no fossils within the Appalachian Mountains that's how old they are yeah, <laughs> yeah. like I don't think that you could really understand that like if yeah. it's got it they existed before bones existed. Yeah. That's like that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely incredible. Um they they often do like various different tours through there and there's the Echo River tour, one of the, the cave's most famous attractions. Um now it takes visitors on a boat ride along the underwater river. Uh, underground river, underwater river. <laughs> that's clever. Bing. <laughs> <laughs> but the tour was uh, it was actually discontinued in the early nineteen nineties. Right. Um 
there are rumours of deep passageways not accessible to tourists as well. Right. So again, this is the Stuff idea. Stuff they didn't want you to find. Mm, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about um, H.P. Lovecraft's short story, um, The Beast in the Cave. And it's it's set in Mammoth Cave as right. well. Okay. Um, now, he finished the, fir- the final draft in 1905 when he was only 14. Wow. So he was, he was hot on it. He was on it from yeah. an early age, yeah. Um, and he published it in June of 1918 um, in an issue of the amateur press journal, The Vagrant. Right. So the plot involves a man on a tour of Mammoth Cave who unfortunately gets separated from his guide and becomes lost. His torch finally expires, leaving him hopeless to find a way out in the pitch black. He then hears a strange sounding shuffling footsteps approaching him. Thinking that it potentially could be like a lost mountain lion, he desperately throws a, a stone at the source of the sound. The beast is hit and it then crumples to the floor. The guide eventually finds the protagonist and together they examine the fallen creature with the, the guide's torchlight. Now, as the, the creature utters its last breaths, revealing its face, they discover that it's a pale, deformed human who'd lived in the cave for years. Wow. So there's going to be some throw then. So the eye the, oh, down yeah. him straight Eat away. As if there's some rock well, or If you good thought there's a lion, like a mountain lion, <laughs> yeah. stalking towards you, like, oh, you put some weight behind it, I'm you? giving yeah. it some of this. <laughs> yeah. You're having this one, so I'm right between the eyes. <laughs> now, this is, um, this is not a, a new concept that humans have lived within the earth as well. And like several sets of Native American remains have been found within. Mammoth Cave. Yeah. Many of these mummified remains indicate intentional pre-Columbian funerary practices. So wow. well before Columbus got there. Mm. Um, another fascinating discovery was the remains of cane torches as well used by Native Americans. So they were going deep in. They were, they were going in with cane torches. They were going into the system as far as they possibly could. Yeah. Um, so if you couple that with the idea that potentially there could be civilizations that live within mm. the mammoth cave system itself, yeah, could there also be entrances to the inner world or the inner so Earth? other portions? Yeah, is Absolutely. that just the, the the kind of the top layer, if you like? Is mm. that just the the, the 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 outer the outer city or the outer you know I don't want to say realm, but do you know what I mean like the 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 outer sort of borders of yeah. what would be an inner no, you know, civilization. Well, this is the again. This is an idea, like I've said, it's not. It's not a new idea, and especially among the Native American tribes. Mm. And the one that I want to talk about as well is the Hopi Indian mm. uh, tribe. That they say that their ancestors emerged from the underworld. Is how they say it. So they came out of the earth. Now, this this in itself, the Hopi Indians maintain that their ancestors did not arrive from the north or by boat. So the north being the Bering Strait, yeah. coming over from Siberia, mm. down through Alaska, through Canada, into... Mm. Yeah, I've learned that from this North research, yeah, yeah, what the north is. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> the north. Wall and the, the wall the north. and the north. Oh, yes, yeah, you've got something coming up about the north as well, haven't you? Haven't I just, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so they say that they didn't come from the north, um, nor by boat, but instead they actually climbed onto the surface from the underworld. The specific place of emergence of the Hopi legend lies deep inside the Grand Canyon. Right. So an enchanted opening from the mysterious recesses of the earth. Mm. Native American law states that the Grand Canyon was formed as a result of a great deluge. So yeah. again, a huge flood. And there's some really, really interesting um, geological evidence that's mm. put forward by um, a geologist called Randall Carlson. Yeah. If you guys ever want to check out his... Um, he went on the Joe Rogan experience with um, Graham Hancock that episode he's done two actually the pair of them together and those two episodes are incredible because they put forward so much evidence yeah to suggest that there was this huge flood of meltwater from um a two mile thick glacier on the mm. north american continent and it just you can see it mm. you can see the satellite images of, of this yeah. great big flood just going right the way across the whole yeah. the whole nation so um yeah so it was a result of a great deluge which had drowned the previous third world. So, you, had, so you mean like there are weather changes without human interference? Mm. Oh, um, oh, yeah. I guess. Oh, I guess in, I am saying in, that's that. That's interesting, isn't it? 
I guess I am <laughs> saying that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Controversial. Interesting. <laughs> I might also say Makes that there's more trees yeah. in the Northern Hemisphere than there was 100 years ago. Mm. Mm. Okay. Makes Interesting, you think, doesn't eh? it? Yeah. It really does. We'll save that for another day. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll get um, a little Swedish girl on the podcast and see what she has to say. <laughs> yeah. Argue that one. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> How dare you steal my childhood? How dare you? <laughs> we love you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the idea is that the the Hopi cosmology uh, specifies that this um, was the place where the Hopi emerged from a subterranean refuge after a flood that destroyed the third world. Yeah. Several inner world entry points are said to be located on their land within the Grand Canyon, one of which is honoured in a ceremony as the dwelling of an ancient parent race. So a sacred site is strictly off limits to all but the Hopi. Um, the law further claims that the Hopi were assisted by insect ant people. Yeah, I've um, heard about the ant people. Yeah. yeah, who live within the earth, within the caves and the caverns, and they were pale humanoids with thin limbs and slightly arched backs. Now, so basically, like me then, <laughs> pretty much pale yeah. skin, that thin arch limbs, back. arched arch back. back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. You're one of the ant people, aren't you? But this is—I um, I, I said this to you, didn't I? About um, about the etymology of the ant people, yeah, um, and right. where that that name necessarily comes from, and what's mm. a really really interesting um, connection is that ant in Hopi le- language is Anu, yeah, and friends, for instance, um, in the uh, Hopi language is Naki, mm. and so if you've got like the ant friends or the ant people, is Anu Naki. Oh, okay. which is really, yeah, yeah, really yeah. interesting um, because that's something that languages that are connected um, from like vast distances, mm. like from one side of the ocean to the other. Um, there's what's really, really interesting is ancient Mayan, or uh, I believe it was ancient Aztec. Right. So the Aztec language mm. um, is written phonetically. So when you write down the words, it's written in a phonetic way. I can't remember what the, the guy's name was. He wrote a book, Fred something. I will find it and yeah. I will put it on, on the socials. And he explored that um, there's a huge connection between um, the Aztec language and old high German. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> das gut. Das gut. Yeah, yeah, very das good. <laughs> but yeah, honestly, they, 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 he's actually found that he said, like, if you actually take these words, like, mm. if you say it compared to how it's written, mm. it's phonetically old German. Right, okay. Which is really, really that interesting. That is interesting, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the thing. All, it ties into other stuff that we've got it coming does tie up into very much. Things. Yeah, so I know. It is relevant. We're not just... Well, we're intentionally rambling. <laughs> we are. We really are. Um, so now this is uh, the Smithsonian Institute yeah. may have discovered artifacts inside the massive cavern um, with intricate passageways and rooms, including tablets bearing hieroglyphics. Right. Um, but this is the thing with regard to the Smith- Smithsonian. It's, there's a lot of um, people that are involved in archaeology that believe that the Smithsonian are covering up a lot of stuff yeah. like there's a, a big I mean, there's got to be cover up across the board in oh, some yeah, I mean, if you think like you know natural history museums and places like the smithsonian and the you know uh i'm trying to think the other name of the place but those types of museums and mm. institutions are showing you everything they have in their possession it's like come on <laughs> yeah they're not they've got no way they've got vaults where they've got stuff that they don't want you to see yeah, that they've it's like found. that scene at the end of um, raiders of the lost ark where you put it in a box and they there's a guy wheeling it away with yeah. a, a whole yeah. warehouse full of yeah. wooden crates and everything. There's, of stuff that's I guarantee found. you there's something that, like that. that. That's real, where all yeah. these giant skeletons are gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It? You know, it's yeah. like it's like the vaults of the Vatican and stuff. It's all yeah. there. There's a reason why people aren't allowed down there. Mm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, there was an article published in the Arizona Gazette in on the 5th of April, 1909, um, that said that the Grand Canyon was once home to a lost civilization consisting of people of gigantic proportions. 
So again, tying back to mm. our Giants episode. Yeah. It also mentions the discovery of an enormous underground citadel by an explorer named G.E. Kin- Kin- Kincaid. G.E. Kincaid. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Got there. <laughs> Who once came upon it whilst rafting on the Colorado River. Um, the entrance to the city was the end of a tunnel that allegedly stretched for almost a mile underground. So this was based off of that guy's um, exploration of this particular tunnel. Right. Um, there was a bit of a, an odd sort of cover-up because, if I remember rightly, Kincaid suddenly disappeared after telling this story. And then all of a sudden people were going there to find Kincaid's entrance, the as entrance, they called yeah. it, um, and they found nothing, supposedly. That is interesting. <laughs> mm. There's... Um, there's, yeah. there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff like that, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, this this is sort of hapless citizens, or you know, people, people like just you and I that it. just stumble across stuff by accident. Oh and, yeah. Because they tell people, and then that escalates, and there's like a whole media storm, and then those people are never seen again, or they just happen to go missing on their next hiking trip. Yeah, exactly. That's like, like they've, their they've backyard something or something. And, yeah, exactly. They've yeah. said something, and suddenly they've disappeared, or yeah. they, you know, they found something, and let it go out into the into the zeitgeist, and. All of a sudden, yeah, they've just been disappeared or yeah. suicided, suicided, killed themselves, yeah. shot themselves on the back of the head twice, and put themselves in a suitcase and threw off a bridge. You know, yeah. that's, that's all pretty right. much, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was depressed. He was depressed. Yeah, exactly. He did yeah. all of that with yeah. depression. The power of depression. The power, absolutely. Yeah, but so yeah. I also want to talk about the actual possibility of subterranean life. Yes. Um, now. This is an interesting fact to go off of our previous small rant with regards to yeah. climate change. <laughs> yeah. Surface trees and plants are responsible for less than one third of the Earth's oxygen. Is it really? Mm-hmm. Marine plants such as uh, phytoplank- phytoplankton, um, they constitute up to 75% of oxygen depending on the season. So it fluctuates. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's actually marine uh, plant life that actually produces oh, wow. the oxygen that we breathe today. So um, oxygen that is... That is a genuine surprise because yeah, well, it's it's kind of thrown down your throat that, you know, the rainforests and all this that we have to protect make up the almost the all of the oxygen that we, yeah. you know, breathe. And if you lose the trees, you sort of essentially suffocate. But trust I guess... The, trust the science. And, yeah, trust the science. Trust the yeah. science, man. Don't, don't guessing, question uh, it. Trust the science. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. guess, yeah, but I mean, you're obviously saying that and then us obviously in a minute going into, you know, more evidence of the subterranean stuff, mm-hmm. It that, that that now makes sense. So it probably shouldn't be as much of a surprise. I know, right? But, but I, mean, it, I mean, anyone that did GCSE level science or, or high school science will know that oxygen is a byproduct of pho- photosynthesis. Mm. Um, they thought that this was the only way that plants could produce oxygen um, until they, they, until they just like discovered uh, thermal vents and that completely changed the model of deep sea marine life. So right, okay. the idea was that previous to them finding these deep sea thermal vents was that it was all just full of bottom feeders. So something yeah. dies in the sea, it floats down, it just gets, that's where the idea yeah. of bottom feeder comes from. So they had no idea that there are now these huge thriving ecosystems mm. deep in the bottom of the of the ocean where the sun doesn't touch, mm. but there's still plant life down there that's producing oxygen yeah. without the use of photosynthesis. Yeah. So further studies of these particular um, ecosystems, scientists found that life thrived in these environments and life forms grew to much larger than expected sizes. And at these deeper depths without any aid from the sun. So instead of them using photosynthesis, they've been using chemosynthesis and it's oh. is you and then chemosynthesis is used where chemicals such as hydrogen sulfide allow these organizations to produce uh, orga, organizations organ, <laughs> organisms i'm reading my notes here <laughs> organisms <laughs> organ, these organizations of creatures at the bottom of the ocean yeah <laughs> fuck's sake dear lord <laughs> pick glasses on dear oh my goodness mate <laughs> Baz, can i have that coffee please yeah. <laughs> yes it, yeah <laughs> um yeah they this chemosynthesis uh, is allowing um, plants to produce oxygen. And obviously there oh, okay. are other creatures that feed off of these plants and then there's creatures that feed off of those yeah, it creatures. It must be something like that, mustn't it? Again, you've got to believe the science because, you know, 
they're, they're even now they're finding. It wasn't it recently I read an article where they've just found an, a new uh, a new species of like jellyfish or something that shouldn't be able to live as deep as it yeah. like is, but it's basically completely like see through, but emits all these like colours. But we only know that because we shine, you know, lights on it. Absolutely, well, down in those depths, it, it just. It's just see through. No, well, no. This is the thing. Is in a lot of cases. That's also something I want to talk about as well. Is um, bioluminescence. So in these deep sea environments, these creatures mm. are producing light. So oh, right. they might not, and they, and they produce light, especially um, in particular predators. Mm. They produce the light to attract yeah. prey. So, um, like for instance, the anglerfish. It has that little thing that comes out of its head yeah a little light that blinks 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 and then wallop it yeah. has it as whatever comes up to to have a go at it but so for thousands of, of, of different species of life yeah. the power and energy to thrive doesn't necessarily come from above from right. the sun but it it comes from below from within the earth itself right so think about this if all the trees were to be cut down then we would still be able to breathe and that's all thanks to but everyone would be living. Life. Everyone would be living near the coast. <laughs> yeah, well, we pretty much do anyway. Really, I suppose we're not a massive. I mean, we're only country, fifty-seven miles really? away from yeah. the sea yeah, suppose, where yeah. we are at most. Yeah, um, unless you go up. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so, for instance, algae is the biggest contributor to that. And yeah, okay, it's interesting. If you think about it as well, the Earth holds an incredible incredibly large number of bodies of water just on the surface mm. which like each literally teeming with biological active oxygen producing organisms that sustain life so if that's on the surface and it's also right deep down at the ocean's bottom mm. then we also know that there are subterranean lakes and rivers and they they all exist and that mm. ecosystems can thrive off of algae so I'm talking about like shrimps and fish and other aquatic life. Mm. Um, there's also another food source that doubles up as a light source, and that's lichen. Oh, okay. Ever heard of lichen before? L i c h e n. Only werewolves, but I'm pretty sure yeah, you're not talking lichen. about dogs living down there. No, no well, maybe, well, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe. But lichen, um, yeah. L-I-C-H-E-N. Right. Um, it's, did you ever see that video that kept, that was circulating a little while ago about though it was basically blue lights on the shore at night, and as people were walking through well, it, the yeah, lights yeah, yeah, that yeah. is lichen, so oh, it's right. bioluminescent okay. as well as being a food source. Um, now, lichen itself is what's called a composite organism, which means that it's made up of algae and various fungi that work together to a mutual benefit. Right. Now, fungi has also been known to be bioluminescent because in certain environments where there's no um, like wind or anything like that, they have to rely upon um, like a insect insemination rather than right, it being yeah. just taking the spores on, through, on the wind. Yeah. You know, yeah. So there has to be something that picks it up, eats it or whatever, and then moves it to another place. So it has to stand out. So it uses bioluminescence in order to do that. Um, now, lichen itself, it comes in many sizes and colours and forms and often looks plant-like mm. um, and it often appears to be a moss, but it's it's not. It's yeah. not related to moss or plant because right. fungi isn't a plant either. Oh, right. Fungi is actually... Um, it's, more, it's more animal than really? plant because... Vegans are going to hate you for saying that. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You're going to do it, do it properly. Do it properly. Because uh, fungi actually produces carbon dioxide. Oh, right. Wow. It absorbs okay. oxygen and, and produces huh. carbon dioxide. Little mushroom farts. Yeah, so the yeah, little mushroom farts. I think I've had a few of them <laughs> over the years. Well, no think. doubt, no doubt. <laughs> um, it was, uh, lichen itself is actually often found uh, growing on rock. Um Okay. One of the ones that, that I know comes to mind because I was there recently was Stonehenge. So Stonehenge, um, the reason why you can't touch uh, the stones there is because there is a very rare lichen that's growing on mm. Stonehenge. And it's only growing in two places in the world. Right. Stonehenge and a shore in Denmark. 
Okay. Which is quite interesting. It is interesting. But yeah. when you take into account the amount of Scandinavians that came over a thousand years ago, they probably just brought it with probably, them. They and, could have just yeah. brought it with them, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but they've also found lichens in Antarctica that are alive, but they're over ten thousand years old. Wow. So these things, they can they can really live. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, they they they've been known to glow like bioluminescent mushrooms, but they're incredibly hardy. So they can live in the most mm. They rough can conditions. thrive in the yeah. roughest conditions possible. Yeah. So somewhere like Antarctica, where I mean, can't get peng- any harsher, really. Penguins struggle there, <laughs> you know. <Yeah>. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like it's it's if if lichens can live for that long in an environment mm. such as that, then surely they're able to live in within, ideal conditions. How long would they last for? Exactly, yeah, yeah. especially sense, within yeah. uh, a cavern that's within the earth or something mm. like that. Um, and that's lichen itself is is often served as a delicacy um, in Scandinavian restaurants as well. Oh, all right. So I always wow. thought it was, was so really quite a food quite source and an oxygen source. Absolutely, yeah. Wow, okay. So there was um, I, the idea that there could actually be thriving ecosystems within the Earth's crust mm. or within the Earth's surface in this honeycomb-like yeah. maze mm. is perfectly plausible. But the, yeah. I suppose the idea comes, could it actually house a civilization of, of humans? I suppose that is the real... Yeah. I mean, I guess if you believe, you know, the theory, then I guess you'd be going down the road of saying, well, it already, it already does. Mm. A form of humanoid sort of being, not, you know, sort of humans as we know necessarily, but it would be a type of through, you know, evolution and whatever. Yeah. Mm. Um, that they've obviously adapted to. They might have adapted that way, kind of or living down there, yeah. And yeah. some obviously came to the surface, and you know that's where the various Native American mm. um, tribes and uh, the Aboriginal only, tribes and stuff. The only thing that's to probably have, a bit more diff- that makes it a bit more difficult to to believe it is that there's they had no idea of timekeeping, um, which. Yeah. Which, to be honest, you can understand that because really we've. If you do look at the idea of how we look at time yeah. and, and such, and and that we know that it's from past all the way up to mm. the present in, in a linear fashion, yeah. there's some people, there's some scholars that have said that that really only came about mm. when the church started having power and started basically deleting yeah. previous works. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So even down to like our literary language, our literary English, mm. that is really only the forefather of that is Francis Bacon, who is believed to have been the real William Shakespeare. Oh right, okay. Yeah. Well, Francis Bacon uh, translated. I don't know. No, he didn't translate it. Sorry, he wrote it. There was a translation into spoken English, and he turned it from spoken English into literary English um, of the King James Bible. Oh right. So. Okay. And there's a lot of esoteric <laughs> symbology and stuff I'm because sure, he yeah. was he was a, a, a Freemason. Freemason, yeah. Um, Bloody Masons again. Oh, no, they get about, don't they? <laughs> yeah. They get, they definitely get about. <laughs> but he, um, he supposedly put a lot of allegory, a lot of symbology into the King James Bible, mm. which then pushed out a lot of other older things. So, for instance, the Book of Enoch, which we've spoken about before, yeah, which comes up in this. Which yes. Yes, it does. It does. It does yeah. yeah, but um, Sumerian as well. Yeah. So the idea was that potentially languages, even spoken languages, <coughs> didn't really have a linear sort of fashion, right? But they were cyclical, and that which I remember talking about that film Arrival with those aliens. They yeah. came down. They spoke in a cyclical fashion, or they, yeah. their their literary language was cyclical. Then they experienced time completely different to how we do now. Yeah. So if they weren't any timekeeping, then Maybe that's why. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin with trying to theorise that. But, you know, if you also believe that, you know, we're not alone in the universe, then, you know, not every planet would have a sun. Where do they get their light source from? How would they then use things like sundials back in the day to, you know, tell the time? Mm. I'm guessing these subterranean folk would probably use the running water or... Isn't it in Gears of War they um, they use, uh, they call it emulsion. And it's basically magma. That they use it's as a power source. Mag- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the lambent are the uh, 
the creatures that that's right yeah. that live sort of within it. But yeah, it's basically emulsion, basically like, like a, a type of um, fluorescent lava. Yeah, basically that they use as a life source. Um, to yeah, power so everything. Yeah, rather than it so, being from a sun. And if they're that if they're that deep in the in the earth, and that's fictional and all that. But, then, well, no, uh, but I mean, it, 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 the it idea has is some kind there. of yeah. The, the science has to come from somewhere, I guess. However mm. far you stretch it, and you know, kind of elaborate on it, you know, to make it work for fiction um, or non-fiction. Yeah, it's um, it's got to come from somewhere, I guess. And yeah, I suppose mm. if they're that deep or they're, they're deep enough in the earth, then they, they probably are sort of hitting springs or certainly even lava vents itself, that, and they yeah. use that to. Well, that's that. that um, the thermal vents certainly exist within the Earth's crust as well because there's yeah. that huge cave in Mexico, the the crystal mm. cave. Yeah. With those massive mm. crystals that have I mean it hits I believe it was hundred and seventy five Fahrenheit. I can't remember oh, what it equates to in, in Celsius, but it's fucking hot at the yeah. very least. <laughs> a bit toasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A bit of boy, a bit warm down here, boys. <laughs> yeah. But um but yeah, so like we know that those sort of things exist as well. Yes. So yeah, we do. Yeah. And especially if there's freshwater springs, we're within the Earth's surface. Yes, absolutely. Then yeah. These ecosystems definitely could thrive. They um, definitely can. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah, definitely. There was um, there was something that you spoke to me about mm. that I was quite interested to hear a little bit more about, and that was the Schlaraffen Land. Map, <laughs> yeah. So I'll say land. Schraffenland. Schraffenland. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Oh, good, it just yeah. Um, I've been trying to practice saying that, and I'm still probably getting it wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, Schlaraffenland um, is basically it's German, if you hadn't guessed. Oh. <clears throat> um, and I mean, it, well, I, was, I sort of, it, it, basically in terms of how I've done my notes, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but okay. Um, in terms of these you know, kind of, you know, either mythical places or subterranean cities, you know, this, this is basically the German version. Mm. So, you know, um, oh, I've got hair in my mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you're talking about, um, you know, Shangri-La, El Dorado and the like, um, that are believed to exist, mm. then Schlaraffenland is one of them. Yeah, it's one of those other it's legends. It's just the it? German sort of version, basically. The, the, the translation is basically the land of milk and honey. Um, they, they believe that the rivers flow with, you know, with, with honey and milk sort of rains from the sky. Right, basically. Gotcha. Um, in French, the it's... Willy Wonka uh, factory. Yeah, basically, yeah, more or less. Yeah, that's where it gets a bit <laughs> fantastical. Um, and in French, it's uh, known as cocaine, which means the land of plenty. Um, and it's the same place, but that's just the French word for it. It's, um, it, it's mostly kind of mythical, but there are a lot of, um, a lot of ties to places like Shangri-La, um, El Dorado, um, and Hyperborea, mm. which is one that you put me on the, the sort of the path yeah. of, which I'll obviously go on to in a bit more detail, you know, in a minute. But um, yeah, it's, it's basically, it's just another, um, another sort of utopia, another, this is kind of less subterranean and more of a, a sort of an island, um, which is believed to be kind of north of where, France is now. Or hi, what, Hyperborea or Schlaraffenland? That, Hyperborea, Hyperborea, yeah. Hyperborea, yeah. yeah. Um, Schlaraffenland is, um, or cocaine, whichever you want to call it. Um, there's a lot of arguments as to where they believe the, where it is, mm. basically. And I couldn't really find anything that would kind of, where anyone would sort of say, right, yeah, this is where we think it is because this is what we've found or yeah, kind this, of anything like that. This it, was, with the Shrilafen land, the, the stuff that I, that I found out about with it was that it was within the earth. So it wasn't right. necessarily a land upon the surface, but it was a subterranean kingdom that right. had its had its place somewhere. There somewhere. was an entrance yeah. to yeah, Shrilafen land where, yeah. somewhere. But there was, so there's a like a lot of these subterranean um, sort of cities or, you know, communities, civilizations, whatever, there's always a surface entrance or a surface element, you know, sort of to it. Mm. Um, and yeah, and this is, like I say, this is this is very much kind of one of them. But yeah, it's basically just a, a utopia. It's, a, a, you know, an underground paradise. 
Mm. Which he, and the inhabitants are blessed with, you know, extreme luxury, um, you know, peace. You know, they're protected from, you know, like a lot of the others. Which is why I'm yeah, probably going to gotcha. rehash a lot of the information. But you know that they're not, um, you know, they're not uh, sort of affected by you know things like war, and yeah, like adverse all the, all the, weather, all the crap and that goes on on the surface, all the stuff that we sort of get stuff. battered with. Yeah, they're sort of blissfully unaware of it, basically, and yeah. so they live a very different kind of lifestyle. You know, they're all very kind of loving to one another it's like the city of zion yeah exactly yeah, yeah pretty much that, that sort yeah, of thing really pretty much that it's a it's a it's a utopia that it's for me out of everything else that we'll go through for me this is the one thing that i think is probably more on the mythical mm. only because i i found a i did find an article um that was kind of talking about its uh its existence uh, or believed existence and they in, I mean, I'll, I'll paraphrase. I won't obviously go through everything that I found, but in in a nutshell, they were basically saying that that Schlaraffen land was kind of created by sort of German peasants, people living in poverty as right. a way to escape the world they were actually living in. So they okay, yeah. so they would dream of themselves living in this land where milk would rain from the sky and and honey was in you know flowing through the streams mm. and. I think the other thing was that roasted pigs would be running around the, you know, the the, the grass. <laughs> it's a very very fantastic. Yes, yeah, so a very fantastic. Already yeah. roasted pigs. Exactly. Yeah. Take it started a chunk off. Out of them. It started off relatively believable when you sort of started, but when you read these other articles, it did start to go more into the 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 sort of the the mythical. And and someone did land on the fact that they believed it kind of stemmed from a time where you know there was a lot of sort of poverty and. You know, a lot of people sort of living as what we would now know as sort of peasants yeah. in in Germany, presumably, um, and so this was created as a way for them to kind of escape their reality and to, yeah, like I say, imagine okay. themselves living in a, you know, this kind of fantastical to world. Hope for, that sort yeah, of thing. But, but then there are, you know, those that want to look into it and will kind of say that, you know, actually this was a subterranean, you know, city much along the same ilk as places like Shangri La and mm. El Dorado. But what's quite interesting was there was a, a map that emerged. There is a, a map. supposed map that, that emerged of Sharofan land. There is. And yeah. I can't remember who basically it landed on the, the doorstep mm. of, a, of a German cart- cartographer. Yeah. Um, and he. Then I can't remember what his name was now, um, but he then translated or, or copied yeah. said ancient map mm. and got it out it, out there again. Um, yeah. Again, apparently he was again one of these people that disappeared. Yeah. So. Yeah, because I couldn't. Because interestingly, out of everything that I found, which was seemingly the more kind of fantastical stuff, mm. I didn't find anything on that about its origins and, and where the the map actually came from. It's almost like it oh, just okay. popped, like. Like just and then it just appeared, and, yeah. and people was like, "Oh yeah, well that's where Sharafan is." Well, this is, is the thing with regards like- to ancient maps as well. Was there was um, the the Piri Reis map? Uh, Piri yeah. Reis was, um, I think he was a, a, a Persian cartographer, right? Um, and he compiled a map that, and we've only got fragments of it. Now this this map was huge. Like, mm. I mean, it would cover a wall, and it was all of the known world. So the whole known world that had been surveyed and been mapped, and on this fragment that's left over, you can see the uh, east coast of South America mm. going all the way down. You can also see parts of the west coast of Africa yeah. going down. And then right across the bottom, you've got the land. So this, bearing in mind, this map was produced in the 1500s. Mm. And we didn't find Antarctica until the 1800s. Mm. So this now had, this, this map, details the land mass mm. that is Antarctica, Antarctica without does, yeah. the ice. Yeah. Yeah, it's all green. Yeah. And lush. Without the ice. And it's but it's a it's a smaller land mass than what's noted on the on the maps, but the fact that it's noted without any yeah. ice. And at this all, is like yeah. is accurate as mm. well. This yeah. is how ac- I mean I don't think I mean you should check it out, the Piri Reese map mm. and you will it you'll see just how accurate it is compared to satellite imagery of the land mass. So not the yeah. ice, mm. but the land mass of Antarctica. And we yeah. didn't the Western culture didn't discover it until the eighteen hundreds. No. But this map, this Piri Reese map, he said that he copied it from older map sources. An older map, yeah, that he translated or whatever, yeah. yeah. So when did they find Antarctica? Where the hell did they find it? Well, it would have been easier to sort of navigate because it wouldn't have been bloody snow and ice. Exactly. It would have been like lush, green, depending on Greenland where it was. and forests and woodland. And, yeah. 
Absolutely. Depending so, on how far back you know you sort of you want to go. So, mm. but the yeah. what we found quite interesting was that um, there are rumours that the entrance mm. to Sharovenland mm. is to the north. It that's is what I found that's is quite interesting. Yeah, that's what they. Yeah, I mean that's that that reference there kind of ties in a lot of a lot of it a lot of what we'll go over. Mm. You know, kind of in a second. But whilst we're sort of on the mystical, I found something that I'm not sure you found, but okay. it harkens back to a previous episode. So I think you might enjoy it. Yeah, go for it. Because um, I thought I'd start a bit light-hearted with the kind of stuff that I found that was more mystical. You know, we don't want to jump in two-footed to any yeah, theory and be no. like, yeah, we believe it, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> no, so if we find the stuff not. that is, um, to coin a phrase, utter nonsense, utter nonsense, then uh, I do like to bring it to everyone, <laughs> especially if it makes me laugh. So yeah, Sharaf and Land is one of the more mystical um sort of subterranean uh, locations. And another one uh, I found in Celtic lore, um, there is a cave called Rathcoggan, um, which is also known as Island's Gate to Hell. Yeah, I have heard of this. And yeah. uh, according to legend, strange creatures would emerge uh, and were then seen on the surface of the earth. Um, there are also stories of knights and saints venturing into said cave on Station Island in County Donegal, where they made their journeys inside the earth um, and then were forever in a state of purgatory. Was this the one where they built a fortress around the the entrance? I didn't deep dive into the actual entrance. That one was actually mainland Europe. I can't remember what it was. I think it was something like Slovenia or or something like that. Right, okay. There was a similar sort of story that comes out of that that area Mm. in which they built um, a fortress around the hole. Right, okay. Basically. To stop people... To stop in it, probably no. To stop things from coming out. Oh, coming out. Yeah, oh, shit, right. Almost like okay. a almost like a night's watch sort of thing. Right. Okay. Like, yeah. Well, that, I mean, it makes sense just going by, you know, this story. See, so, yes, these saints and knights would go in uh, to the into the earth, and either that either they wouldn't come out, or if they did, they were in this like yeah, what was known as a state of purgatory, which is kind of like a between, sort of a between life and death. So when they came stance. out, they were just like yeah, they were just like kind shell of shell shock. Yeah, yeah, melancholy. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. Um, now in County Down, not a little bit of Irish way, oh, Northern, yeah, Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah, um, there is a belief that says that uh, there are tunnels that lead um, to the land of Tuatha Du Danann. Ah, the Tuatha Danann. Yeah, yeah you got you got to pronounce it correct. Tuatha Du Danann. Tuatha Danann. Tuatha Danann. That's, yeah, that's how the, they pronounce the it. Dirt, I know, but that's how they pronounce it. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. So you just ignore the duh yeah. bit. All oh, right. Yeah, okay. Forget the duh. Right. The okay. Fine. Danana. 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 We just always have to ruin it. Yeah, we? sorry, guys. It's always that quality <laughs> content. Quality content, as always. Um, Seal of approval. But yeah, but. Um, yeah, the reason reason why I thought you would like that is because you know, as you know, um, we covered um, we covered them in our fairy episode. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So they believe that in County Down there is a system of tunnels that lead from the surface of the earth down into the the land that is occupied by the uh, the Irish fairies. Excellent. The That's Tuatha cool. Danann. The Tuatha Danann. Danann and Arnan. <laughs> I can't say it seriously now. You've ruined it. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know at what point to mention this, but it was just kind of a throwaway sort of fact that I found. So I thought I'd mention it now. Yeah, go on, go for it. Um, but the Aurora Borealis, mm-hmm. or the Northern Lights, yep. um, is, uh, is believed to basically be gases that are emitted from the inner Earth, which is why the colours are so vivid. Yes. Mm. Because it's, yeah, it, it's... Um, yeah, it, it's it's gases that are emitted from mm. the Earth's kind of inner core. So it's like core. a natural process that the Earth and then goes when it through. hits the atmosphere above us, mm. that's what then you know sort of it become ionized and the, it yeah, creates the glow, creates the Northern Lights as mm. we as we know it. But it could actually be an effect of well, inner Earth. This is something that has been um, observed on other planets as well. So uh, in particular, uh, Saturn. Now, what's right. really, really interesting about Saturn is it has a hexagonal storm at the, uh, the at the North Pole. Right, hexagonal. Like, I mean, it's actually like purpose. Pop, pop, pop. Yeah. yeah, it's like 
it's got the dimensions Cut out in that shape. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's odd. Yeah. It's really really odd. It's, yeah. Um, but yeah, they've they've been able to observe aurora borealis at the north at the North Pole in on Saturn at the very least. Wow. As well, which is quite interesting. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. But that's, yeah, but I thought that was quite an interesting because it was when I was looking into all this like kind of inner Earth stuff and the various cities and stuff, and that was just a kind of a little paragraph at the bottom mm. of one of the articles, and I thought, well, that's interesting. So I, yeah, so I thought I'd bring it to the populace as yeah, a bit well, of a throwaway I comment. Like that. That's cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, did you want me to jump into the other bits, or have you got something to follow um, on from that? No, or? I'll tell you what. I reckon because I've got the. If you go, in, could you go into Hyperborea? Because I've got something. Yeah. Or I could go into this actually. I tell you what. Let me go into this first, and then yeah. Because well, I've got the Hyperborea after Hyperborea this. Hyperborea and a few of the other possibly well-known uh, sort of cities that are believed to actually exist. Yeah. And I've even got like locations and stuff, but they're more kind of Sweet. religious, if you okay. like. So I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of follows yeah. on from what I'm saying, but I know you've got a couple of other bits to... Yeah, I've got... Um, of... Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll go through this. It's the story of Olaf Jansen. Okay. Um, and it was published in 1908. And it is actually... It's presented as a true account of mm. Olaf Jansen, right. um, a Norwegian sailor who along with his son, discovered the northern entrance to the Earth's um, interior. Right. Now, they allegedly lived inside this unimaginably gigantic caverns deep inside the Earth for two years as guests to a very tall, European-looking inhabitants of the underground network of subterranean colonies or cities. Right. So again, this is uh, they're going on the idea that it's all connected within yeah. the Earth's surface at you could travel from one city to yeah. another. So it's not just a land that's mm. within the within the, the earth, but there's different yeah. places you can go across there. Um, now, the original inhabitants are said to be the, well, the, the capital of this inner earth city. Um, it's said to have been the original Garden of Eden. Right. This okay. is what he's claiming. And cool. had everything that you could imagine from a place that regarded as a biblical paradise. Right. Um, a beautiful uh, protected oasis deep under the crust with flowing rivers full of oxygen producing algae, like we previously like we said, discussed. Yeah. Uh, plenty of fruit trees and a soft diffused glow from light, uh, of light from bioluminescent vegetation and mushrooms that kept in the massive caverns perpetual, perpetually lit. Right. So cool. this idea that there was no sunrise, sunset, it's all just a nice soft glow. So it doesn't matter, does it? So exactly. going back to that thing about having to like till the time and the time of day and stuff, you yeah. probably didn't need to. So the, again, this is the idea that there's a northern entrance to the inner earth, mm. potentially at the North Pole. Yeah. And I know that you looked into Hyperborea, which is set to be set to around be the North in Pole. That, in that area, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's that was something that I just wanted to add into there. And the yeah. story of Olaf Jensen, you can find it online. Um, it's quite, it's, it's a good read. It's a good read, actually. Is it um, just a, is it a book or is it just like an account? A couple of pages. Of, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah it's I'll like, a, it like yeah. a short story sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I believe there's like three or four parts to it. Um, oh, okay, cool. So it's not it's not yeah. huge or anything like that. No, I'll but give it a check. Yeah, yeah, it's worthwhile having it, yeah. having a, a read of it and seeing the details that it comes up. And he's um, that account is one in thousands that potentially yeah. I could I could go on about over and over. That was the thing. You had to get to a point where it was like, oh, no, that's enough to make the point. Now we've got to stop because otherwise you could just go on and on yeah. and on. And well, like, I mean, to be honest, making the point and it's like, all right, there's, we get it. <laughs> there's so much about inner Earth mm. theory that. Potentially, we could do another episode along along the lines. Oh, man, really? Quite. I mean, quite easily. Like this could be one of like three parts. Oh, I yeah. think just from what I've found on the actual caves and the inner workings mm. and how they're connected, what they're connected to. This could even be like a bit of a, almost like a bit of a conspiracy sort of episode that we could, could do, be, yeah. which we could if they're interested. Yeah, we did Double mention it, with, didn't uh, we? Yeah, the NAC another, guys. Yeah. yeah, not another conspiracy. Because they did guys. the uh, the. Uh, Hollow Earth. Um, no, they, well, they did well, Flat the Earth, didn't flat they? Flat Earth, sorry. Yeah, Flat they Earth. They did They've the Flat Earth um, sort of aspect, and that took them to regions and parts of the world that the inner Earth theory takes you. So mm. there could be quite a cool opportunity to... I think this is far like more cross... probable than Flat Earth, for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. 
but sure. um oh absolutely but this um yeah this kind of yeah sort of crosses a few paths with those guys so that'd be quite um yeah that'd be quite uh interesting mm. but yeah this could quite easily be a two or three parter if we investigate you know other you know elements that we've you know found well, even by just going through the the caves and the mountain ranges themselves and how they all connect and oh, the honeycomb of systems you know because there are continents and cities well the thing is i know that that are believed i know jj will like what we've got coming up yeah in the, re- for the yeah, rest of this yeah, episode jj will for sure yes yeah. we are gonna we will mention admiral bird we will indeed yeah um, we can't not really but we won't we won't mention too much of his stuff from Antarctica, not too much no but no, because well th- those guys done it brilliantly anyway mm. so there's no there's no need for us to kind of regurgitate it but i have to mention some of it just so it's all sort of within context but yeah i don't yeah. deep dive to the extent that they oh, did okay. um because they've already done it so go and check out that episode yeah, if uh, if what i'm about to go into go piques your it, interest yeah. Yeah. but um i thought i'd start just going off of the sharafan land and uh you know the uh the uh cave in ireland that the name i've already forgotten um <laughs> What was it called? Raf Coggan. That was it. <laughs> I was about to say the Devil's Hole, but <laughs> or, the, or that. Yeah, that would have been aptly named. Yeah, that was Ragnarok, that as well. wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. that's the Devil's Arsehole. Um, this is uh, another uh, sort of location that I think, in terms of like the, the general populace, is probably believed to be just a you know a mythical kind of land or or place. Um, but if you you know read what you believe and you go mm-hmm. down the right rabbit holes there there is a lot of evidence to suggest otherwise but um just to throw it out there go shambhala shambhala yes um which if you're a gamer like myself pops up in tomb raider and uncharted and all the others so p- there's probably people out there that are c- probably quite well versed in uh, in this anyway but um for those that don't know in tibetan buddhist uh, tradition shambhala is a spiritual kingdom um the sanskrit name is supposedly taken from a few hindu references um one being shambhal which is a city located in the um uttar pradesh district of india apologies for any butchering of the pronunciation but yep. uh, Uttar Pradesh district um the other is uh, uh Shambhalpur uh, which is one of the largest cities in the state of Odish India mm-hmm. um so they believe that their name has sort of been taken from both of those kind of reference points okay, and job. then kind of put together almost um excuse me um people believe that Shambhala was the influence behind uh Shangri-La which for the most part I think is mythical. Right, okay. But um, Shambhala, not so much. So if, Yeah, so Shangri-La fo- follows on the same sort of follows idea. Follows on the, the same land path. of milk and honey, that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, the more fantastical side of of these spiritual kingdoms, I guess. Um, someone's basically taken Shambhala and exaggerated it. I suppose it's like the idea of like the, the idea that um, New York was the city paved with gold. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, basically that type of thing. Yeah. yeah, it was a way of kind of creating a more fantastical idea of this place, so more people kind of got on board with it, I guess. Mm. Which is how you then got Raf Coggan in Ireland, and you know you got um, Schlaraffenland the land of in, in and, Germany, and, and, such. and yeah. So y- okay, yeah, so ahead. they believe that Shambhala was a direct influence to um, to Shangri La. Um, in terms of its size, it's uh, it's believed that um, Shambhala is two hundred and forty five. Yoyanas, Yoyanas, which is a, f- a form of measurement, apparently, oh, right. um, in India, I think. I'm guessing it's like, yeah, Hindu. yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, I've even written it here, dickhead, um, which is an Indian form <laughs> of measurement. Yeah, yeah, Jesus Christ. Read it, it'd help, wouldn't it? It's, a, <laughs> it's an Indian form of measurement. Right. Um, in kilometres, uh, it's about 80, uh, sorry, 2,940 kilometres um, or 1,800 miles. Wow. So it's yeah, it's basically for context. It's uh, the northern part of India is just over eighteen hundred miles wide. So it's believed yeah. that Shambhala alone is, e- is more or less equal to the size of northern India, wow. which is the second largest continent by population. Is it or country by population? Some I don't. Know, I've read that and is it? Like, I think so. I know China's way up there. 
Yeah. And I'm pretty sure it, by population. Oh, uh, density. It's, yeah, it's oh, the okay. second. Gotcha. Like, so just, yeah, just to help with the context, if that's helped at all. Apologies if not. Um, now, th- th- so that's a kind of a, a, a very sort of condensed idea of what, you know, Mm-hmm. Shambhala is um, in the late 19th century um, Helena Blavatsky yes. uh, who was the head of the Theosophical Society, mm-hmm. basically a religious faction, alluded to the existence of Shambhala um, herself she claimed to be in contact with a member of the Great White Lodge um, which is believed to be a group of higher beings um, now this is linked to quite heavily linked to the teachings of uh, one Alistair Crowley mm-hmm. um, and also it popped up in the secret cipher of the Euphonauts. It did, yeah. Um, that I'm still reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, so yeah, so again, it, it harkens back to a lot of what we found in uh, the Hellier um, episodes what I was saying that we did before about um, occult societies and yeah. esoteric authors and, and such. They, which is basically they all, what they they've are, all bought into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they very much do believe that there is something there, something there. It, well, so. not only that, but that some of them have been there. Mm. To be honest, that, some of them have been in contact with higher beings that have come from, um, come from mm. inner earth. Elena basically, Lavasky, her her story is interesting. Really is very, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I'd, yeah. Yeah. Implore anyone to go and read it fully because I, I I could sit here and regurgitate the, the whole she, account. But... She started up the Theosophical Society. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah. And that is still <laughs> yeah. something that's still going today. It is. Yeah. Um, and it's still within a lot of um occult circles and yeah. I know I keep saying the word occult. What I've got to remember is that occult really does mean hidden. Yeah. That's all that that means. It's it's not like, I know it says the word cult in it, but it's not like Jim Jones and drinking the the Kool-Aid. It's, (laughs) it's, it's about hidden knowledge and, um, the, 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 the inner alchemy. Yeah. So the idea that your, your body is a vessel for a yeah, spirit for that then else. eventually, yeah. for an alchemical sense, transcends. Yeah, so basically, that's yeah. pretty much what she's that's what, what she's she going down. Stu- yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Um, now, um, yeah. So yeah. So adds the uh, Crowley in his teachings, and also the secret cipher of the Euphonauts obviously came up quite heavily in our uh, Hellier um, sort of deep dive, uh, and also the, the Hellier documentary, which people should still go and watch if, if you haven't, because it is nuts. It's really good. Um, so that's one uh, kind of reference uh, to it. Um, but in the period of 1924 to 1928, two explorers, uh, who actually I think are a couple, embarked on an expedition uh, to find Shambhala. They believed it was located in the um, Baluka Mountains in Russia. Um, this uh, was the... Ent- so, yeah, so that was the entrance among three peaks of the Altai Mountains. The Altai mountain range is a region where Central and Eastern Asia, Russia, China, and Mongolia basically all converge at one point. Mm. Um, now, um, uh, Balk in Af- or Balk, I don't know how you pronounce it. Yeah, in, uh, Balk. Yeah. Balk in Afghanistan um, is another believed location of the entrance uh, due to its due to its historical and religious significance. Yes, that does uh, make sense, and that, and that popped up. Afghanistan pops up a lot mm. in a lot of this stuff, religious or otherwise. Mm. So it's quite the well, you know quite what? the hub for it. I'm glad you've brought so that was up. It, actually, was it because oil that they were after when yeah. they went there, or was it absolutely the because stuff, I or? came across um, a story from um, Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, bless her. Good lover. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> love her. She's, she's great. awesome. I, uh, I think she's brilliant. She's brilliant. I think unfortunately she's been taken for a ride in a lot of cases. I really yeah, do. I think so, yeah. Um, but I think she's absolutely brilliant and her heart and her mind is in the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's very endearing. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah and she's, and she's she funny. was telling the story about how she got in contact with some um, US Special Force operatives. Yeah. Um, or should I say ex, like mm. veterans. Yeah, yeah. And um, they had battled um, a, well, giants, basically. Mm in a few different caves within Afghanistan. Well, I think we might have inadvertently covered one of them in the Giants episode. I think, yeah. Do you remember when I said that there was a, a group of, a, a, very much that, a group yeah. of soldiers 
patrolling through well she um, came I saw it on you know when you when you're scrolling yeah. through Facebook and something yeah. Linda Martin how video. comes on I've yeah. got to watch it yeah so, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and she started talking about it yeah. as well and I, I, I won't be able to find it again now but yeah. she was detailing the same story that yeah, that, yeah. You, that you found as well um, difference is she actually spoke to the veterans that were involved supposedly I just read the article supposedly so, yeah. this supposedly is, but because it's all about a lot of it is anecdotal yeah. they can't bring out any sort locations of and locations and exact details or yeah. any photographs or anything any yeah. solid evidence yeah that which is an interesting i'll get onto that yeah, i'll get yeah. onto that later yeah, yeah. the whole idea of there being solid evidence for stuff yeah yeah um but yeah yeah yeah, yeah go go ahead but, and continue. Um, but yeah so yeah so getting back onto the uh shambhala stuff one of the most um heavily believed locations is tibet in the himalayas so much so that the nazis left on a number of expeditions between 1930 Mm -hmm. And 1939. Um, now, this was under the direct instruction of that Heinrich was, Himmler and Rudolf Hess. That was those were the ones that um, were detailed by the West, and yes. it's since come out that they were going a lot earlier than that. So, oh, wow. so before okay. the the um, the Nazis really got into power, they were already sending out. So this is what I found. So the rumors emerged that the secrets had um, of of. Agatha in particular Agatha, yeah. was the one that the Tibetans uh, yeah. really do believe in. Which kind of like the was, Holy Grail of spiritual kingdoms, oh, yeah. isn't it? This Agatha, this is what kind of everyone was kind of looking for, but seemingly found mm. other entrances or other cities or yeah. other and, evidence. And Tibet in itself was a very, very secretive country or very secretive mm. culture. But outsiders uh, weren't allowed in. No, they, well, they weren't. weren't they weren't the Nazis the first... They were. First, um, I don't know if it was the Dalai Lama, but what, didn't Hitler or someone high up in the Nazis actually have a, a meeting with the Dalai a Lama, Tibetan yeah. monk? It might have been the Dalai Lama, and he gave them express permission to go and do whatever it is they Absolutely, wanted to do. Because what it was down to was the, um, the, the it was down to the philosophy that they both believed in. Mm. So there was also the use of um, the swastika, yeah. which they both used, the Tibetans and the the, the Nazis, yeah. and so taking out what happened within the second world war the nazis mm. used the symbol correctly for what they believed in correctly in terms of what they were trying to achieve and mm. what their belief system was kind of based around yeah they so used it for there's the a lot right of reasons in terms of, of misconceptions with regards to like the the super race and and stuff like this there's mm. a a lot of misconceptions about yeah. it. So the idea of like the Aryans, mm. um, the Aryans referred to a cosmological age. Yeah. Because um, right now we're in the cosmological age of Pisces. Yeah. And the age before that was Aries. Yeah. And Aries. So Aryan referred to the people of Aries. Yeah. Rather than it being a race of people. Yeah. But was just a people that existed. Yeah. So it wasn't Within just necessarily time, about yeah. the tall, blonde haired, blue eyed people. It yeah. was about the people that actually existed within that time. So yeah. potentially there could have been um, like darker skinned people, there yeah. were brown, brown eyed people that were also referred to as Aryan. As Aryan, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of There's more to it than just a yeah, that, superior you know? race type thing, yeah. But yeah, so they were, they <clears throat> met, there was as many um, expeditions for, to Tibet from 1926 yeah. up to as far as 42. Yeah, well, that, so they that were, makes sense because the, the Nazis adopted the swastika in 1920. Mm. So for them to then be going to that part of the world only five, six years later, yeah, does kind of yeah. stack up, I guess, that there had already been that communication, you know, sort of between them. But yeah, maybe it was only until the 30s that we that the rest of us kind of caught wind of it and, you know, sort of caught up with what they were doing. Mm. Well, um, apparently the, the reason for these particular journeys, these these expeditions into Tibet was mm. to document discoveries of fossils of giants yeah. that had been found by the Tibetans. Yeah, Hitler really believed. He, yeah. he was like a cryptozoologist, really. He was really kind into of. he was really into a lot of it. And a lot, among other things such as like the ancestral heritage such as that, there was um Oh, what do they call it? It's an ancestral heritage think tank. That's the word, think right. tank. That's called the Ananurbe. Okay. Um, and they were searching for communication links between Tibet and Agatha. Because right, okay, the Ananurbe yeah. very much believed in Agatha and they believed yeah. that Tibet was the place was in the which way you to needed get to go yeah, to yeah. get there. Um, yeah, that's basically it in a lot of pop culture, isn't it, as well? Yeah. That Tibet is the the, the way to 
the way the place to aim for absolutely sort of thing, yeah. and this is the thing like they what they were trying to find was they were trying to find what they called true supermen now mm. i know what i just said almost contradicts what i've just said but when i talk about like true supermen is said to be men that harnessed and mastered the power of the uni- like mm. universal power that the germans called vril mm. um but it's also known as chi ki prana uh, uh, qigong mm. and ether as well by it's called ether by alchemicalists yeah. so like helena Blav- blavatsky yeah um even alistair crowley they would have called it ether so right um anyone that's a star wars fan would call it the force yeah it's yeah. a natural thing that exists around us that that someone can harbor and you can yeah, touch manipulate you and, know as yeah. long as you find the ability to do yeah. it um yeah because yeah, there is a belief in in the existence of of that as well and yeah that's very much what they were kind of looking for and i think it was more of the cuz the, the next thing i was going to go on to is that the the inhabitants of shambhala are believed to be highly enlightened um sort of beings so when you say like superhumans or whatever that's probably more what he was they were looking mm. for these these highly enlightened super beings that can harness this energy and Ones more that, spiritual, more connected to the, to the earth. And, they've, yeah. gone, they've gone a tear up from they've, what we are yeah. now. He wanted to look for them to find out how to do it, mm. <laughs> basically. Um, and yeah, and it's also obviously, of course, a Buddhist pure land, which is why no one was allowed into, you know, Tibet at mm. all, really. I think even to this day, I think it's pretty tricky to get yeah, to certain well, parts of it, I think. Well, I think China's done mm. a few bits over there and yeah. they've... Um, They've no done. Doubt. They've done their part. The Han Dynasty of China yeah. has done their bit. Yeah, exactly. That's for sure. Um, so Buddhist monks believe the location of Shambhala is uh, located on Mount Meru in the Himalayas, um, basically the the mystical North Pole of Earth. Mm. Um, although they also believe that it's it it takes you there, but Shambhala isn't on our sort of planet. It's believed to exist on the astral plane. Mm. Um, so you've got the North Pole as physically a pole in the snow. <laughs> yeah. You know, the electromagnetic North Pole. Yeah. And, and Whereas this is the spiritual or mystical North Pole, and it's located on this Mount Miru in the Himalayas. Well, it and makes that's sense, where they actually would pinpoint, because that's what could be the, you know, the highest sort of energy or. Well, there's definitely an energy grid across the planet yeah. and a lot of these various different stone monuments in mm. particular are on these lines on those locations yeah um we even discussed straight lines in Helia again we do yeah the idea that it, locations it's come are up linked. again in a minute yeah oh really it okay does. good good it does it comes up yeah quite prominently actually um oh, i'll let you continue in, then in something i uh, i mean i'll have to jump through my notes because i've done this all a bit out of order but um oh, yeah no worries man you're out, of, you're out of order. You're out of order. <laughs> um, and I think, again, just kind of ch- chiming off of what you said, um, you know, earlier, Native Americans believe that their ancestors uh, came out of the earth. Mm. Uh, Cherokee Indians speak of a subterranean world, uh, much like our own with rivers, mountains, trees, and, of course, people. Um, Central Asia and India um, are almost entirely... I say covered with tunnels and cave systems, obviously beneath their surface. Um, some kind of known entrances in terms of caves that have been found mm. are in Afghanistan, uh, Canada, Arkansas, uh, California, uh, which is the Crystal Cave, yep. um, Malta, um, the Dolce in New Mexico, yep. um, Mount Lesson, uh Sorry, Mount Lassen, California, mm-hmm. the Brown Mountains, in North Carolina, which is uh, we'll see Helia again. Of course, yeah, Helia. Mentioned We're briefly in, that in there. There's some weird happenings around there. That's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Um, North Carolina, uh, Brazil, mm-hmm. Mount Shasta, California. Uh-huh. Yeah, which, that came uh huh. Yeah, yeah, which came up. Uh, Mongolia, India, Tibet, Arizona, Turkey, and the one that surprised me. Glastonbury, England. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, it's in Welsh. I think it's something like Anwyn um, is the, is the name of it, I think. Oh, okay. It's like it's a double N so the, W. Well, there's N a cave called. Like it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's 
called the, the, it's either the place in Glastonbury or the mount the the cave itself is called Anwin. It's, yeah. it's uh, obviously given a Welsh uh, Welsh name, and that's believed to be uh, an entrance to uh, that's cool. sort of inner earth. So. Glastonbury road trip. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, exactly. Pack One of the only time I actually want to go to Glastonbury. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you're right. Um, <laughs> now, aside from you know those, there are more kind of notable um, uh, entrances, which are the ones that are kind of pinpointed on most most of the maps that you'll find if you search for an inner Earth map. Yeah, these are the ones that you'll see kind of noted around the uh, edge. Um, but you've got Mount Epimeo in Italy. Um, the Pyramids of Giza, the mm-hmm. North and South Pole, the Mammoth Cave System um, in Kentucky are the, the sort of the main ones that I could pick out from the um, the sort of the map yeah. um, that uh, that was thrown up. Um, and also, as we mentioned earlier, um, it is also in the um, Book of Enoch. Uh, he was told of the middle of Earth by an angel um, and that it's a blessed land and that there are um, vast cavities with mighty waters oh, um, okay. that run. Blown. I just what, wonder man, whether the I middle of... We're uh, going to have to do a, a Book of Enoch episode. Oh, yeah, without doubt, yeah. We're going to have to do that. Yeah, I'm going to have to get far smarter and uh, actually read it all first, but, yeah, at some point, <laughs> yeah. a couple of years down the line, yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, maybe do a course in anthropology and then get back to it. But, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah you know absolutely, I mean? yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I just wonder, like, reading all this and then... You know, you read things like that, that, you know, that he was told of the middle of earth. Mm. Middle earth. Yeah. Is there some middle sort of... Middle earth, yeah. Yeah, just Well, of, yeah, absolutely. But this is... Is there um, a kind of, you know... Well, I know Tolkien often, he got a lot of his inspiration from the Scandinavian legends as well. And yes. the Scandinavians referred to the land that they lived in as Midgard or middle earth yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, um, he was also given access to... Um, Literature and documents in Finland, in the well, in in, in Oxford uh, that vaults as well. as well, which is literature that isn't allowed to be seen by the general mm. sort of populace, which I think pretty much confirms the history of Europe. Yeah, um, which is where he got a lot of his well, influence spent, from. He spent a lot of time in Finland mm. as well, and um, I, I know I mentioned this before on a previous episode. The the uh, Elven language is a yeah. mixture of Welsh and and Finnish. Yeah. Um, so he was also a, and a linguist yeah. as well. So he wasn't just like a, an author; he was a scholar, a mm. linguist. He he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was a clever chap. Mm. The old and boy. he says there's yeah. no. He always maintained there's no symbology in this. There's no allegory or right. anything like that. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. said this is just me telling a story. Just so, yeah, just happenstance okay. that it, it. Yeah. Okay. All right. all right, I'll choose to not believe you on that one. Sure thing. Oh boy, the greatest respect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, just to um, kind of keep on the same sort of path. No, no pun intended. Um, but you mentioned the sort of the straight lines. Yeah, and, the main uh, lines is what yes. they, they call them, isn't it? Um, this is more so to do with um, sort of navigation, but there is a. Uh, what is known as a, a Mercator projection. Mm. Um, now, this is a basically a cylindrical map projection that was presented by a, a Flemish uh, geographer, Gerardus Mercato, mm-hmm. Mercato, however you want to say it. Mercato. 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 Mercator. All that, yeah. Yeah, Mercator. In uh, in 1569. It was interesting that it you was... You got me going with yeah, it. Exactly. I think I said it right the first time, and then you I did, fluffed it up did. the second. Yeah. Um, it, just to start off, I think initially that I, he was interested in it. He, he was claiming to have only have presented it. Mm. So it was like, where did he get it from? Yeah. But anyway, um, it, beca- it it's, it's essentially become the standard map projection for navigation um, as it basically showed everything that was up as north and everything that was down was south Yeah. by literally two straight lines. Um, now, when first released... One of the main contentious points um, against what kind of navigators and sailors predominantly were using at the time um, was that it used geographical directions instead of magnetic. Hmm. So basically, if you wanted to go north, you just you sailed upwards. Yeah, you know, and if you wanted to go south, you sailed downwards. Whereas at the time, they were using magnetic uh, navigation, i.e., compasses, to 
yeah, circumnavigate, okay. basically. And when you when and I'm sure you've found this, but you know, when you read a lot of the theories as is to where, you know, the entrances to inner earth are and these other, you know, kind of geographical locations, they they pretty much all document the fact that they had to just kind of follow their nose, that they basically just went in a straight line. So if they thought they were oh, they, facing north, yeah. that they just went north. And this is where they oh, then found Oddly these- enough, they often say things like, I was guided by God or something like that. Like they, they yeah. often have an experience of being guided in some way, almost yeah. like they didn't really have control over hundred percent control over yeah. exactly what it is that they were doing. Exactly that. They knew what they were yeah. doing, but they, they the didn't. idea yeah. of it all came like they knew they had to head in a direction and that they knew that it felt right. That, that it felt right that they were going that mm. way, but they wasn't necessarily convinced that it was north they were going in. But all their because all their instruments were going haywire and, gotcha, and, yeah. and everything else. It, it it comes up quite a bit in um the Admiral Bird um account, which obviously I'll come on to. Yeah. Um so yes, yeah, so that was the contentious point. They were using basically magnetic compasses to navigate north, south, east, and west. But this theory that was offered up um, was basically just using geographical directions. Right. So okay. basically, if you go right, you go in east, and if you go left, you know, and that kind of yeah, thing. If you go gotcha. up, you go in north. You know, far more simplistic, I guess. Um, and yeah, so that was the main contentious point, which is what any. <laughs> It was basically ahead of its time, this this map proje- uh, projection, because it actually took two centuries before it was adopted mm. and implemented into kind of general sailing and, you know, navigation. Um, and uh, so due to its use of straight lines for essentially what is a more simpler kind of form of navigation, uh, it is obviously for great travel. And so it, it basically distorts the countries and the continents that are closest to those lines. Mm. So basically everything that's closest to the equator um, is smaller. Yep. And then the further you get away from the lines, the land mass increases. Right. Gotcha. So things on the on the map will look far bigger than what they actually mm, are. Yeah. So if you get a map, a flat map of today, and oh, you yeah. look at the land mass of Antarctica, it's probably three thirds larger on the map than what it is actually well, the in maps, existence. The maps are, are they're, they're distorted we know a lot, anyway. Yeah. They're, we know they're, they're distorted they, anyway. The maps that they get that they print today have mm. a well, it's more than half of it is dedicated to the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Basically. Mm. So the equator you would usually say would be halfway up the map that's displayed yeah, essentially there. That's it's the, actually probably two thirds. It's meant to down. be the idea, yeah. Yeah, and I've that's gotcha. what and that's what this original map was basically showing. The equator was slap bang in the middle. Then he had two lines either side of it. Mm. He was basically saying that's north, that's south. Yeah, figure out the rest yourself, sort of thing, uh, which is obviously far you know far simpler. And I think that's what a lot of people kind of didn't like because it wasn't using these particular um, instruments yeah. as as in, you know sort of intended. Um, now. Um, yeah, interestingly, it has slowly been replaced by other versions, uh, although these aren't any less accurate. So the ones that we're using today aren't any better than this map projection. Right. It's just a different way of um, displaying it, I guess. So, I mean, up until about four years ago, Google Maps, uh, Bing Maps, and, mm-hmm. and whatever else actually used the Mercator projection. Right, okay. Uh, it's only when they brought in Google Earth that they stopped using it. Because gotcha. then when you kind of zoomed in, you could tell it was all kind of distorted if they used the same formula. Mm-hmm. And then I think I think they said when they actually then done street view or something, there was an element of that that meant they couldn't use that projection. So they had to go to a different right. format, so, which kind of worked for the technology. This Mercator then, he was, like you say, he was ahead of his time in regards to the cartography that he was producing. He was yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It only says that he presented it. Which to me suggests that he so, was yeah, that he was given it, producing it, but either is... but either way, it was ahead of its time because it took two centuries mm. before before we started using it because there was such a kind of uproar about it yeah. that people didn't believe in it. People, you know, and it was a it was contentious in the fact that the way he was sort of saying, "Well, this is simply how you use it." People were like, "Nah, it can't be that." Yeah, you know, I've yeah, got exactly, my compass yeah. that tells me north that way, and you know, so people were just kind of dismissive of it, you know, without. Without really giving, giving it, it a, a chance, really, yeah. which yeah, it's human nature. You Absolutely. Um, he also said, you know, he produced mm. um, another map because he was a he was a cartographer. 
He was a geographer as well, he yeah. He had the uh, the ancient Arctic map as well, didn't he? He did. Yeah, now that's an interesting one. That is a very interesting one. Yeah, yeah. do you want to, have you got anything on I, that? I, I, I didn't, only because we weren't going into the Arctic and that too specifically, so yeah. I kind of left it out deliberately, but... Okay. But yeah. But yeah, okay, well, I'll, I'll just go a little you, bit you about it, because what, yeah. the, the, the ancient Arctic map itself uh, details the land of Hyperborea. Yeah. Now, the, we're, we've spoken about the idea that the entrance to Inner Earth is at the north... Hyperborea is said to be at the North Pole. Um, that it's it's, said. it's hidden. It's said <laughs> it's yeah. hidden underneath what is now sea level, um, with it being four hundred meters higher than what it was, say ten thousand years ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But the what it what it constitutes of. I mean, you guys can go and look at it. You can look yeah. at either ancient Arctic map or Mercator's map, and you'll certainly yeah. come across exactly what it is that we're talking I about. I think it's more prominent on his on the on Mercator uh, map. It's the in same terms thing. Of, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I say it seems more prominent on that map as opposed to when they break it down into the oh, Arctic okay. one. Yeah, okay. From Good what job. I saw, yeah. But I didn't make any specific notes. Well, um, what, it, what it details basically is it's four rivers throw. Uh, flowing into the centre of the this center land of the map. mass, yeah. which is said to be um, the North Pole. Yeah. Now, what they also say is they actually show that the rivers flow into the Earth. Yes. Now, that's what this this particular it map does, yeah, details. It flows into the centre of it, yeah. So what old cultures, ancient cultures have, have suggested is that the entrance to inner Earth is at the North Pole. Mm. Mercator's map suggests that there is... An entrance, an entrance to something there. there. Yeah, um, and then Admiral Byrd had a an interest, a very very interesting flight over the North Pole. He did as yeah. well. He did. Um, but just to because I've got a, I have got all of that Piper stuff. But just to finish oh, off okay. on the um, Mercator map, so we know that it was it was uh, adopted, you know, two centuries down the line because a lot of the contentious elements, you know, to it. Um, but another possible reason, you know. That I found, which you've, which you've just you know sort of rightly pointed out, is that um, it's a map of obviously the the poles in a, in and or sort of the North Pole, and the rivers that flow into it, as you say, are in the subtle shape of the swastika. Mm. And that so was I, an interesting thing that yeah that I I almost had like a little bit of a light bulb moment over the Christmas period because. I do. I I watch a lot yeah. of things about yeah. these ancient cultures and, and such. And Hyperborea came up, and it was uh, it was a video about um, the the use of the swastika, which mm. is there's a common misconception with that. Well, swastika is actually a, a Sanskrit word. It's well, the, not the, the Nazis have ruined all. it. Oh, absolutely. Basically, but yeah, it, it means yeah. well being. So again, I've made a note of that as well. So. So it, it seems to kind of go down the more academic route to say that it took so long to be implemented because of the because of how it kind of went against the form of navigation that they were using at the time, which was using magnetic compasses as opposed yeah, so to just geographical locations. Again, up was north, down was south. Mm. But I seem to, but by reading through sort of other stuff, I know we spoke briefly about it yesterday, but I think a possible reason that it's slowly being kind of replaced and, and almost like shunned is because of this subtle shape that the rivers make mm. of the, the swastika. And obviously if they were able to just kind of rely on what its true purpose was and kind of where it came from, then it probably wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. But because of the Nazis... Well, it's, well the, the thing is, the, it's, the it's had, that symbol's had many names over the years. I mean, I, I said to oh, you last night... Oh, different plantations. Like, really, ideally, I'd prefer to refer to it as the Tetraskelion. Yeah. Really, because that's the, that's that's the Greek of, word, and yeah. swastika is actually the older form of that word, yeah, yeah. Of, of that symbol. But it's a symbol that's been used for thousands of years. Yeah. It's not... Yeah, and as you rightly say, uh, swastika is uh, an Indian Sanskrit word yeah. meaning well-being. Yeah. So it gives you an idea as to what its um, intended use uh, is. And, and, this is. and it's been used by Hindus and Buddhists, amongst others, literally for millennia. Oh, yeah. So long, it, long before. Mate, there, there are, there are a Christian um, temples in Ethiopia mm. um, that are dug out of the rock. They're, they're carved out of the, yeah. the bedrock into the ground mm. and they've got swastikas they've got stars yeah. of david on them yeah they've got the the crucifix cross well, i mean the, found the, case, the swastika and the star of david which yeah. is often called the seal of solomon are often portrayed right next to each other or overlapping each other yeah so this is something that if 
guys, if you w- if you do want to learn more about it, then go and find it because yeah. you're not going to be told by any sort of history class no. or it's certainly not the mainstream media, but you need to go out there and, and actually yeah. look for this stuff because yeah. otherwise there's huge misconceptions about this particular symbol. Yeah, exactly. And just to sort of end on that, that it, it was... It was only adopted by the Nazis in 1920, as, as I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, and it was then changed to a symbol of brutality, fascism, and sadly, genocide. But for millenn- After 1945. Yeah, but for millennia mm. prior to that, it was well-being, peace, mm. love, kindness, and, and all that stuff. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was just one, one person kind of took it and, and kind of ruined it. And it's forever been kind of tarnished, really, unless yeah. you know where to look to yeah, kind of find... I want to make this very, very clear as well. We're defending the symbol, not the acts done in the symbol. No, no, name. the symbol, the symbol. <laughs> <laughs> and its origins and its intended yeah. meaning and all that all that stuff. Um, but yeah, but so just, just to move on, because I know we've, we've kind of dropped a few breadcrumbs <laughs> yeah. sort of along the way. But um, yeah, so, so much like Shambhala, there is another, um, you know, possibly mystical land linked to this inner earth theory. Um, and as we've both previously mentioned, um, that is known as Hyperborea, um, which is mostly Greek law. Um, it is a mystical island uh, in the far north of the earth. So it comes back to, you know, the straight lines. Yeah. It's at the furthest, you know, sort of north. Um and it's uh, believed to be situated far beyond the north, uh, uh, sorry, the north wind. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was or is a, a paradise where its inhabitants could live for thousands of years. Um, interestingly, <laughs> if you wanted to cut your time short on uh, Hyperborea, um, then you would dress yourself with garlands and throw yourself off a rock eh? into the water. What? It's your impending doom, apparently. If you didn't want to live for thousands of years, oh. if you'd had enough. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> you completely lost me there. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, so if you were living the in Hyperborea and you're, you're, done, you're like, yeah. my time's up. They'd live for thousands of years. Get into a cer- ceremonial dress. If you didn't want to, yeah. take a dive. You'd basically strip down, wrap some garlands around you, jump off a rock, and and that'd be your lot. Um, they were, of course, a long lived race, um, untouched by war hard toll and things like old age and disease Hmm. didn't have any of that hence for living thousands of years absolutely yeah um now the the land is is or was bordered to the north by a great ocean um known as oceanus um which is also the name of a Greek titan, mm-hmm. interestingly, um, which is also... Oh, yeah, I just said that bit. <laughs> uh, on the south, it is bordered by the um, uh, Repaion Mountains, assuming I've pronounced that right. Repaion Mountains. Yeah. Okay. Um, its uh, peaks were inhabited by gold-guarding griffins uh, and its valleys by a fierce tribe of one-eyed men. Um, ah, the Cyclops. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Um, Boreas was a winged god of the wind. Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, great wind was known as the North Wind, um, which is where the island is based. So you've got this great, as north as you can go, you've got this great wind, mm. and then beyond that is is Hyperborea. Gotcha. So it's protected by this god Boreas, the great wind, mm. and then within that, it's got other sort of titans and gods supposedly uh, uh, protecting it. Um, it is ruled supposedly by three priests of the god Apollo, and they are known as the Bore- Boreades. Okay. Possibly. Um, and they're the sons of Boreas. Oh, the sons of Boris. So it's all Boris, Boreas. <laughs> Jackass. <laughs> so it's all. Uh... <laughs> Lockdown. <laughs> go out. No, the other Don't one. go out. Boris. Go to work. Don't go to work. <laughs> Um, if you could go to work, don't go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dickhead. Yeah. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Are you right? So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, in terms of kind of like real world stuff, there are very early maps that place it north of what is now France. Um, but the more modern theories place it among the, uh, the Ural Mountains of Russia. Uh, specifically on the western coast, which border the Arctic Ocean, mm-hmm. um, which starts to bring us over to 
kind of <laughs> where everything everyone else seems to think it is. Yeah. Um, now it is also you know kind of believed or widely known that uh, Admiral Byrd uh, flew over and saw potentially saw Hyperborea when he flew from one pole to the other mm. with I think two or three companions. Um, he was assigned to Operation High Jump in 1947. Um, the main objective was to actually go and build an American training and research facility in the North Pole. Um, misconception there. That High Jump was on the South Pole and it was an invasion of um, over 8,000 men, aircraft carriers, frigates. It was an invasion mm. of... Yeah. Antarctica. Yeah. And that was 1946, I believe, Operation High Jump. With the flight over the North Pole, it was just. Um, this, was a in his, this was in his flight. account. Right. That I'm, take, that I'm reading this from. So. High Jump on the North. No, uh, I'm sure High Jump was on the South right, Pole. But, well, yeah. But yeah, yeah, go on. It's. Yeah, so he was he was assigned to that operation anyway in, in 1947. That was believed to be the main. Well, it was the main objective that was put out to everyone. To the to there the world. There was a. There's conspiracy that there was actually a different um, reason, and that was uh, to actually search for evidence of the rumored German base two one one. That was the that's the actual real reason people believe that he yeah. was sent there, but the. Yeah, the, the idea the was kind of the um, hush hush was that they were going to build Neuschwabenland their Neuschwabenland own... was the mm. the yeah. area of, of mm. Antarctica that yeah. they were supposed to be invading. So yeah, so this basically so the base that he was going to kind of scope out and start building and then kind of working on was basically to serve the same purpose um, as the German base that he was actually going to kind of find evidence of and mm. no doubt probably destroy. Um, uh, da, da, da. How were the only yeah so yeah so that that the was basically the he was sent there to build a base that was basically the same purpose as what they believed the Germans had already done before them, mm -hmm. um, but yeah the actual reason was that he was supposedly going to go there and destroy it. Um, however, the only difference um, the, the only difference really being between the two bases was supposedly anyway was that the Americans was going to be a training and research facility. But the Nazis is, is actually a, a lab where they were carrying out experiments. Mm. Um, you can imagine the type of experiments they've done before, so it was probably along that same kind of same kind of thing. Um, we we also know from you know the previous info that they were also looking for um, Shambhala and that he was obsessed with you know this Aryan race, which I know we discussed a yep. bit earlier, um, and they were. Um, yeah, hell bent on finding other, you know, pure races. So these higher beings, these spiritual beings, and they obviously firmly believed that this location was the entrance to, you know, kind of finding that. Because I'm guessing Tibet threw up, you know, nothing that was of interest to you know to them from what we, well, yeah. from what we're told at least, mm. um, and what's you know presented to us. Um, now, in his flight, Admiral Byrd reportedly found the entrance to the underground city of. Um, Agatha or Agatha. Agatha yeah. um, he also uh, communicated with the master who was the city's leader. Um, he basically confirms that they um, they've not showed any interest in uh, in humans or surface folk, I guess, <laughs> yep. uh, before, but choose to do so um, when we as a race um, launched the first atomic weapons over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, it was that alarming to them that they launched their own aerial craft to investigate the damage that we had caused. Um, these craft were called the uh, Flugelrads. Um, apparently, um, we're not supposed to harbour such weaponry and power, and so they took it upon themselves to basically come up and have a word, see how we'd used it, and yeah, basically have a word and say, yeah, don't, <laughs> yeah, more or less. Um, now, according to the master, um, there are vast tunnels under Tibet, um, Giza, and the North Pole, and it's the one at the North Pole that leads to Agatha. Mm. Um, that was just basically a snapshot of their gotcha. conversation because yeah. obviously if I went through their whole conversation yeah, yeah, I'd be sitting here for an hour we ain't got time we ain't got the time but no but that was the um, yeah that was kind of a in a nutshell 
pretty much what they you know sort of discussed. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, there is a transcript of um, you know the flight and exhibition um, online, which we've both read. Um, I'll only go through the interesting bits, but there are quite a few of them because he breaks it up in like five or ten minute segments. Right. Okay. So. There are quite a few. I mean, you'll probably recognise all of this um, anyway. Um, so the flight takes place on the 19th of February, 1947 at 6am. Um, between then and 9.15, um, they basically do all their checks, um, check the fuel, check the clocks, mm-hmm. make sure the compasses are working, uh, the comms are working with the uh, the base camp, and they gradually increase altitude. Obviously, there's about four entries into his diary or a log, sorry. Yeah. That goes blow for blow for each bit. So I didn't want to cover <laughs> no, that. No, you don't need to go um, through that. By 9.55 a.m., the aircraft uh, has reached 2,950 feet and Admiral Byrd records seeing a mountain range up ahead. Uh, they consist of a small, a smaller range um, that hasn't been recorded before. It's not coming up on any of their kind of maps or the kind of known... Uh, sort of locations or areas of interest. Yeah. Uh, five minutes later, they are heading over the mountain in what they believe is a northward direction. They are uncertain as the compass on board is playing up, hmm. basically barking back to what we were discussing earlier about the magnetic uh, way of navigating. Um, beyond the mountain range is a valley with a stream running through the middle. Uh, the baffling thing about it is that there shouldn't be a green valley there when you take into account where they are. Yeah. There shouldn't be where any they, green. Well, where they, or where they think, they, think are. they are, Yeah, at the very least. Um, it should all be ice and snow. There shouldn't be any greenery or anything. Uh, to the to the right of, of uh, said uh, stream, um, he notes great forests growing up on the slopes of mountains. Uh, another five minutes pass, and the aircraft increase their altitude again to 1,400 feet. They chuck a sharp left um, to get a better look of the valley. It is uh, green with a type of moss also covering it. He comments on the light being different as he can't see the sun anymore, but there is a light emitting from somewhere. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they make another left and bird notes seeing a large animal below. Now this I was like, what? Um, he claims it's an elephant. Then on further look, uh, basically decides that it's a mammoth. Yep. They drop their altitude to a thousand feet and take a look through binoculars. He confirms that it is a mammoth, although he can't quite believe it, and he radios the sighting back to base camp. Probably his first mistake. <laughs> yep, that's his first mistake. <laughs> that's his first one. Yep. Um, this lasts about 30 minutes, and they encounter more rolling hills. The temperature is reading around uh, 23 degrees Celsius or... 74 Fahrenheit for Mm. our American friends. Um, Continuing in that direction, the navigation tools um, now start to work, um, but the radio doesn't. Below them, to their surprise again, they see a city. Um, All on board believe that it's impossible and that there shouldn't be a city there. Um, Then on their uh, starboard, they spot uh, a strange aircraft. Um, they are uh, disc shaped and they close in rapidly beside them either side. The disc shaped aircraft, um, once close enough, um, reveal markings on them that Admiral Byrd was able to make note of. Um, and he basically notes that there is a type of swastika mm-hmm. on the side of both uh, of these disc shaped craft. <clears throat> At uh, 11. 35 a.m. their radio which wasn't working previously starts to crackle and a voice comes through it is speaking in english but with a uh, german accent and it delivers the following message welcome admiral to our domain we shall land you in exactly seven minutes relax admiral you are in good hands which was a bit like mm. <laughs> yeah um the you didn't in- do the accent though I, no, I, I decided against it <laughs> through fear of uh, assaulting yeah. a whole oh, man. nation of peoples. Oh, well. Welcome, Admiral. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> no, yeah, that's why I didn't do it. No. Um, the you should engine, have practiced. Yeah, I should have done, yeah. You should have had more bottle as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the engines um, on Admiral Bird's plane stop 
and he is under some um, type of control from the other craft. Within 10 minutes, they have landed and several men are approaching their craft. They have no weapons, um, but a voice commands the Admiral to open the cargo doors. Mm. Um, Admiral Bird and one of his crew, um, who I believe is the radio man, uh, are taken off the aircraft and down onto a platform. It's a conveyor belt-like platform. Um, it's not on wheels or anything, so it simply seems to hover. And it takes them quickly towards the city that, that you know they saw from above. They arrive at the city um, and eventually stand before a grand door. It opens and the Admiral is told, have no fear, Admiral. You are to have an audience with the Master. Um, they have a lengthy conversation, which I sort of paraphrased a little bit earlier. Um, and a month later, in March of 1947, Admiral Richard Byrd is dragged into the Pentagon and told to not tell anyone about what happened for the good of mankind. Mm. Mm -hmm. so, so that is a very quick... <laughs> um, snapshot of, of kind of his log but it's quite literally from 6 in the morning till about what was it half 11 yeah. in the morning which is when he does his official log on board excuse me it's broken up into like 5 or 10 minute segments so yeah. it goes through every single blow of all the checks and all the scientific data he they was, recalled and he was a very trusted and fastidious man oh he was given the so medal of honour to suggest this. that he could so, make up something like that it's just quite on wild. the whim. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I mean he was clever out, enough. He was given Operation High Jump for crying out loud. He was clever enough so, to make it up. Yeah. In oh, that yeah. respect. And you know, but he was trusted to, you know, on this, you know, operation, on this mission, whatever you want to call it. Because in a in a flight prior to that, I can't remember when now, some early in the forties, I think, he was given the Medal of Honor for um being the first to fly over the South Pole or something in just a mm. normal in just a motorized plane i think or something yeah. it was the first he, one he, yeah he's done both poles and that's where he got the medal of honor so he wasn't just any old numpty stuck in a plane like no. he was he was a big deal to the american air force and to, and to the government and and you know i think that's shown um you know when only a month later i mean i'm surprised it took him a month but um yeah in march of 1947 he's dragged into the pentagon and given a very very stern interview i think I, I, he gives the exact time I think it was mm. something like 12 hours or something, nine, nine or 12 hours that he was sort of interviewed by different, you know, sort of people about what he saw. And, mm. and he was told under strict instructions, you are not to tell this, you know, to anyone, you know, sort of for the good of mankind. But of course, Word like any out. like any good person, he uh, he did, I think it was pretty much on his deathbed or, yeah. or he knew he was coming to the end. And he was like, I'm not taking this to the nah. grave with me. Like I need to... You know, I need to tell people. So, again, why would he be dragged into the Pentagon and well, told a, to not tell to be, about? Well, this is this is something as well to 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 add to that. There is yeah. no, um, what do they call it? Sanctioned flights over the North Pole anymore. There aren't. No, they've actually got outposts, aren't they, at certain mm -hmm. locations, which does kind of tie into the flat Earth thing. That um, was it, David Vice. Is that his name? Oh, yeah, yeah. That he uh, went over. Where, yeah, where the, there's basically outposts, outposts at certain from points flying that yeah, will to stop you pits. from ex, uh, exploring beyond that point mm. or, you know, flying over that point. You know, you're given instructions on where to sort of land or how far you can go, that, that type of thing. So, you know, and but, there are harsh conditions out there. So if you're stationing, you know, soldiers mm. to, to stop people on the off chance that they might try and go beyond a certain point... What is, even, what is it you're hiding? Well, even then, there's um, even satellite imagery of the North Pole. Um, it's yeah. blacked out. Mm. It's redacted. So, yeah. I mean, guys, go and check it out. I mean, if there's, if there's a conspiracy, I reckon there is a conspiracy there. Yeah. Because it's especially with regards to what's surrounding Operation High Jump as well. Yeah. So, what's the, the, one of the other guys that really came up with the idea was the Defence Secretary at the time, James Forrestal. Right. Who... Um, had a bout of melancholy after after Operation High Jump came back right. with a hell of a lot less men and a hell of a lot less equipment. Yeah. Um, basically came back defeated. Mm. Um, he took a swan dive out of a 13-story hotel room. A hospital room, I think it was, or a right. hospital or a hotel. Um, but yeah. Was it a swan so, dive or a push? Mm, <laughs> who knows? Just to... But that, yeah. was, that, was, the, um, that was the guy that was... Big involved in Operation mm. High Jump, along yeah. with Admiral Bird as so what well. What the hell did they find? And 
you know what what were they and there's so there's a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on at the polls guys yeah exactly um yeah it's very very strange and it was quite weird actually because i was doing this research which was very much about the arctic and the north pole and you know and all this and you know inner earth in, um entrances and stuff and on the because i like to have something on in the background just so it's not completely silent um, and I had the uh, the, the new uh, Kong versus Godzilla film. Oh, good with, with Hollow Earth. And it, and I just you know sort of writing away or you know sort of typing away. And one of the main characters like mentions like we've got the we've got the equipment. We want you to go and f- look for um, Inner Earth. Yeah. And I was like, I got what? <laughs> so I kind of I down tools and I was like, well, I was watching it and I was like, oh shit! And yeah, it, and it's and they in, went to like the in Antarctica, and, I believe that, that yeah. that's where they go to to get Kong to and go into the Earth these, and then they follow like, him. Craft and yeah, they they get him to lead them to spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, no way! Like, how's that for synchronicity? Like, and, and I, I don't he think didn't. I'd seen it before, hmm. so I didn't know that that was cropping up. And it just so happened when I was starting the Admiral Bird stuff. Yeah. Um, man. It's, that, it's that, incredible that, that, that came on and I was like that's weird man well, this, is, this is the thing as well like we've we've we haven't covered nearly half of the stuff that we've found about this really be, no just we couldn't because we'd be here I mean, for four hours I mean we're already overrunning a bit anyway is we've it gone is? over what we assumed would it would take oh to, absolutely to go over it but I know we've chucked a few extra bits in and yeah had so, a bit of a, I mean I know chat, but getting off the fence I know which side that I'm on mm. and I'm very, very sure we're gonna do. We're gonna hit this again at a later date. I'm sure it will come up again, or we'll deliberately do a. Um, we we'll definitely another, have to, We're gonna have to revisit episode. this and and just go through pretty much everything that we've found so far. I mean, I've got load more notes and everything that we could go over, but well, there's a lot more that I deliberately stopped myself from going into. <laughs> yeah. Because, because yeah, just because of, of how this episode kind of went, you know, so I didn't necessarily go down the the caves you know, bit and, you know, the sort of the, the power that some of these locations kind of harness and how people try and use it and, mm. you know, other sort of locations around the world, which I know we sort of briefly spoke about yesterday. And, and yeah, there's research that I just stopped myself from, you know, kind of going into on the episode because, yeah, we could be sitting here for four hours, mm. um, you know, j- just covering what we, you know, sort of found. So, yeah, we, we'll definitely need to revisit it, I think, um, and uh, and see, yeah, kind of where we sort of end up but yeah i guess to sort of close this one um yeah i um i would be on the the side of the you know the, I think the, it's there perfectly is plausible. something yeah, it's definitely plausible yeah the so evidence much so- alone just that we've found is pointing in you know in that you know direction mm. you know you you provided the you know the science earlier that that sort of proves that life can be sustained you know deep underground and without the use in the of the darkness sun. yeah you know, and we've got um, you know accounts from you know pretty respect- respected people mm. of what they've seen, what they've found, um, and you've got cave systems popping up all you know all over the world. Yeah. Um, that as soon as they're found, they're shut off. <laughs> yeah, that as well. And people are stopped from caving and you know going down there. And I mean, even just the idea. I mean, even if you don't necessarily believe that there could be um, breakaway civilizations that live within the Earth. Mm. But certainly the idea that the Earth's crust is a honeycomb-like structure mm. that is connected yeah. all the way through, like I guess like the, the the lakes and channels that you have out in Florida, that yeah. we know for sure that every single mm. one of them is connected in Florida. So yeah. why would that not also be a possibility with regards to the Earth's crust, the Earth's yeah. surface? Well, certainly you know? the oceans that connect into rivers and the rivers that connect into lakes and lakes connecting to streams and whatever, and, you know, could those connections be because there's a corresponding tunnel mm. underneath? And we know that the, the Earth's crust is miles thick as well. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily know the rest of it. No. A hundred percent sure. I'm sure there's some sort of geologist out there that will prove me wrong. Yeah. But we definitely know that hollow earth yeah. as a as a as a theory mm. is implausible. Yeah. Because it doesn't yeah. just doesn't seem scientifically um, it does seem, yeah, just does seem plausible as you but say. Inner Earth, not, however, yeah. that yeah, I can totally get on board with yeah. that. And the and idea a lot of breakaway of people, civilizations as well. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of people from long ago, so before there was technologies, before there was science, and, mm. and any of that, that that believed it. You know, religions, 
it's you know it's steeped in you know religion and different religions as well. So you can't just go after one and be like, oh, they, you know, they're making it up. It's you the, know, all religions come from the same it's place. It's the legend of Agatha that gets me. Yeah, it's that legend that gets me. It's like it, that so many people were looking for it, mm. and so many people have the same map, have the same kind of you know, drop the pin on the map in terms of where they think it is. Well, the, definitely the thread to, to pull on, I think, is that connection between uh, National Socialist Germany and, mm, yeah. and the Tibetans. Yeah. That is definitely a thread to That's pull on and, to, and yeah. see what you can unravel from that. Because Break that down, yeah. Definitely. Again, with that, I've been... I've redacted a lot of the stuff that I've found out <laughs> because I think it's worthwhile you guys going and looking for it yourself. Yeah. Um, because ideally what we don't want to do, we don't want to upset anyone. We don't upset anyone with what, like we, with what we bring forward. We don't want to sort of cause any offence or any We also any don't hurt. want that axe so, coming down on our necks either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I say that with a gun pointed at the back of my head. But uh, no, there's some information that I think we can point you in the direction of and we can kind of allude to like, you know, we have... You're you very know, restricted various, on what we can say. With various... Uh, well, I mean, we're not, but we well, say what we like, but we're, we're choosing not to, for, you know, through fear of yeah, getting get lynched for it. But, well, yeah, exactly. But we, we could say it quite easily, but... We could get lynched, though. We, we're getting lynched. We could get lynched, <laughs> and so we're thinking better of it. But, yeah, we're, we're kind of alluding to it, and I think we've done that earlier with the, mm. you know, the various symbol mm. that's been used, you know, sort of through time. The tetraskelion. Uh, yeah, and that was... Uh, yeah, that was, you know, purely just to kind of draw some comparisons and some links between various sort of, you know, cultures and, you know, expeditions and stuff. That was, you know, that's for no other purpose. But, um, yeah, it's definitely worth people looking into that a little bit more and, you know, and their, you know, sort of connection and, and how mm. they came to came to be with one another and help each other out seemingly. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, like I said, we're going to probably go into this a little bit more just because there's so much oh, there's so rich... Much evidence and history and mm. accounts and locations and well, god knows whatever else and yeah. it's just going to unravel and unravel Mate, and unravel we're gonna, so it's going to get very conspiratorial yeah it's going to get like real sort of I think conspiracy. naturally naturally it will lead into yeah. a lot of that i think we've we been alluding to, to that over the past couple of episodes anyway yeah like i think worst, so yeah, yeah last ones of, of, of the previous season yeah you know that there's definitely a cover up of something. Of something, yeah. Um, I being think we're done getting... by someone or a group of people or whatever. Yeah, and we've, we've been, you know, that took us on one direction. I think, you know, now we're going into, you know, another, you know, direction um, of cover ups. And, and that's before we even get to, you know, UFOs and <laughs> the, gov the US government <laughs> know, right. and New Mexico and Roswell and yeah. all that government. And that all time, that all that time in. Is very, all that very, is all very similar. Yeah, exactly. What we've spoken about today as well. Yeah, exactly. That's so, really convenient. Yeah, no doubt when we eventually end up on that subject, we'll end up harkening back to, you know, a lot of this stuff. Mm. Um, you know, just as a little kind of teaser, I guess, you know, yeah. the flying saucers and the aircraft that we see, you know, they're probably not coming from the sky. No, they're not extraterrestrial. Why, why, why do you think they're not? They're just they're terrestrial. Ultra terrestrial. Is that that's the term? <laughs> just that terrestrial. They use? Yeah. yeah, ultra terrestrial. Yeah. So they they they're here. They've always been here. And um, well, why do you think air, air traffic control never never pick them up? Or why well, they do? You know, craft don't go and they do, but they just keep hush about it. That's the thing. Well, no, but what I mean is like coming through the atmosphere. They'd be able to tell from quite oh, a distance yeah, course, that yeah. they're coming through the atmosphere and coming from great distances or whatever. But they only. Maybe they only sort of mention it when they're already maybe here, it's sort of the thing. technology that's used. This is, is that because they came the from thing. down instead of, instead of from, from from up? I yeah. guess <laughs> if that makes sense. Absolutely. But yeah, but that's just a, a teaser on what is uh, yet to come. I guess. Oh yeah, <laughs> quite a way down the line, one would imagine. But definitely. Uh, but yeah, I think um, I think that's pretty much. I think we kind of done it through the episode, but I think that's kind of us. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've got off the fence for, there, really. For what and, we've covered, but you know, we'll, thus we'll far, definitely but be, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll coming definitely back to going it. back to Naturally, this one, guys. Naturally, I think we'll be coming back to it. At, In uh, Earth Part 2. Might not be the ep next episode, but it'll be no, somewhere down the line. it will be one of them, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so in closing, guys, thank you very, very much yeah, Thank you as for, always for listening to our first episode of season two yeah hope you've enjoyed it we've uh you know we, we certainly have it's been a different type of yeah episode sort of for us it's been more sort of conspiratorial i guess as you said earlier mm. it's been you know more conversational than maybe what some of the others have, have sort of possibly been if that makes sense yeah. but um and certainly the research took us down a path that we uh you know that we weren't um you know expecting so um 
yeah so thank you for sticking sticking it out i hope you enjoyed it as uh you know as much as uh we have mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um so yeah we just want to in closing so we just want to remind you guys to go and support your favorite podcast heading over to patreon yeah. and having a look Please at those do. uh tiers that callum described earlier yeah um also another huge thank you to hellfire studios um yeah. uh, as well for the housing us again yeah um and, and making forget, all this possible making yeah. it possible and also yeah. don't forget about going and getting your 20 percent off with uh the discount yeah. code cryptid yep obviously you know well. we're on the socials you know we're on facebook we're on instagram we're on twitter yeah. we're on youtube as well we are yeah um we may there's another little uh project that we've got coming about on youtube <laughs> that we're think tanking about <laughs> which uh, yeah. i will okay. allude to now but yeah, that okay. is all you're getting yeah okay um yep. and also i suppose it, we've better um announce the next episode and this is going to be well I, I guess just a before one. just before that whilst we're on the uh the the thank you is actually just our current patrons yeah justin and james just yeah. another thank you to to those guys um they you know they sort of get involved uh, you know as much as uh sometimes as much as we do well <laughs> well this next episode <laughs> on, is born uh, out of, of uh out of our patreons really absolutely that's why so, yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. another big thank you specifically to you james because yeah. we're gonna uh, finally attempt to answer the questions Your you've question. been putting to us yeah um the, the big the big one yeah, yeah the big <laughs> big question so yeah. what is the meaning of life yeah 42 he's 42 so thank you and good night thank you and good night <laughs> yeah. no no he's um he, he's asked many questions over the time of, uh, that he's been listening to us and and he has yes the the question that can really be boiled down to have we lost abilities to communicate with other realms of existence yeah. Um, that being either the spiritual realm or yeah. a, um, a a parallel universe that exists yeah. next to ultra terrestrials, us. ultra terrestrials, these, these enlightened higher beings that we're you know that we're told mm. about. So yeah, it kind of um, links quite nicely into you know sort of what we've just uh, sort of spoken about really you yeah. know, in that respect in terms of like the communication and and can we. Can we do it? Did we ever he's, do it? He's and put forward some really, really good ideas. That yeah, good ideas. Are, a couple of good arguments. Certainly and ask the, the same question. Um, yeah, and we will be thinking, looking at all we? of these various different things. So we will be looking at um, stone monuments and their potential. Yes. Um, There's purpose. been more than just stone monuments. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What, what was their intended? So purpose? I'm really quite excited so, to get into this one in particular yeah, I mean, I've, be, I've already uh, another good one i'm already set going to be sending over a few little bits and pieces over oh, okay. to you to get you on the right, same sort okay. of wavelength lovely okay. um but ultimately yeah i think it's going to be good because we're going to go away do our own research and try not to talk no, to each other no, too well, we much don't normally it's only on this one because of my struggles that we had probably a little bit more of a chat than you know kind of yeah, what we normally would but yeah normally we we don't you it'll know, be good to come until back the to next first time. day before when we have our little planning chat and even then we just kind of go through the timings the structure and and that kind of thing we don't discuss kind of no coming off the fence or you know where our research has taken us because we like to like it to be a, as much of a sort of surprise to yeah. us i guess as uh you know as, as you guys so, so I'm, i mean i've oversimplified james's question there but, oh yeah that was and paraphrasing will, yeah, big somewhat, time. yeah so <laughs> i'll go through his 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 line of questioning in full in yeah. full at the beginning of the, next, the next episode uh, episode yeah so absolutely but until then until it's goodbye then. from me. It's goodbye from me. And remember to ask yourself if the old occult adage, as above, so below, is true. Ooh. And whether or not it means anything to you now. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> very good. You like that, yeah? I like that. That's yeah. a good one, man. <laughs>